All right, we are live on, we're live on Rockfin. Live on Rockfin, we are live on YouTube. Here we go, the much awaited collaboration with our buddy here, Bazed Lit Analyzer. He's the littest, bassedest lit analyzer. We'll call him uh we'll call him Professor Bazed. You may know him from uh he's he's been lurking in the chat, harassing you bigots for a while now. He's been spouting his uh, his bigotry in the chat and he's over here to uh to spout his bigotry live on stream today. Thank you for joining me, my friend. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate this. Uh long time long time uh long time chat chat member uh mod fan of our beautiful tristana here primal edge health and uh yeah thank you so much for having me i think this is going to be really fun it should be edifying and fun so really appreciate you thank you okay, long, long time mod first time caller um, right. so we're talking about dostoevsky today uh we're talking the underground man notes from the underground this book it's it's actually the cover of yours. I like the cover of yours. Check out mine. Mine's got like that '90s style Goosebumps cover. Yeah. It's like 1992. This one, this version's pretty cool though because it's got a chapter. Uh, it's got the Grand Inquisitor, and then it's also got passages from Chernyshevsky's "What Is to Be Done," which this book is actually. We were, we were laughing about this in DMs before. This this book notes from the underground. Uh, Dostoevsky is like one of the first battle rappers. He's like he's like a battle rapper of literature. He's the, he'd be he'd be dissing on Chernyshevsky and some of these uh, communist socialist utopianists in this book. Um, and there's a lot of references to other literature in this book. And our buddy here, Bay's Lit Analyzer, is very good at spotting those references. Um, yeah, Tr Tristan, you called him the first irony bro. He's the first Zoomer. So yeah, I he's really the original like Zoomer. He is. He's the yes, first irony yes. bro. He uses irony excessively. Uh, he has a great sense of humor. He does have that Zoomer humor that we all uh, love and sometimes hate. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he, he also has a love-hate relationship with himself and doesn't seem to be able to delineate very well between the two. And by he, we don't mean Dostoevsky, right? This is a character in his novel. The underground man is what the character is often called. Do you know, do you know, was it 1861 that, or four that this was published? What year was this one published? 1864. Yeah. Published in 1864. Um, and it's interesting, you know, you bring up the, the, um, the nameless, the nameless protagonist here, the underground man. And that's, that actually, um, th like Tristan was just saying that, that there are so many, this, this prose work gives birth to so many other great works of literature. I mean, it's, it's so dense. It's so thick. It's so complex. One of them I, I just realized um, is this book that I read in, in eighth grade for summer reading, which I still have, which is Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, um, which is based directly on, um, on the underground man here. Um, and there's, yeah, we're going to get into um some of the references, some of the things that, um, some of the ways that this book has like manis manifested itself into modern literature and into film. Um, and it, I, there's just so much to go over with this book. I mean, I, I, you know, I, Dostoevsky is like continuously surprising in the same way that Shakespeare is um, and sort of endlessly rewarding. And there's so much to get out of it. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just getting into Dostoevsky now. This was my introductory book, um, and I chewed on this book for like, I don't know, maybe like a month and a half now. You know, I've just been kind of digesting it slowly, and it took me it took me a, cu a good couple of weeks to read it at first. I mean, it's only it's like 115 pages. The version I've got here, um, it's but it's dense, right? It's uh, it's broken up into two sections. The first section is more of a stream of consciousness, where you have um, a narration style that I'm pretty sure Dostoevsky spearheaded this style of like the the untrustworthy narrator, where you don't really know you know you can't trust the narrator, and it's 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 shoved in your face that you cannot trust the narrator, and this is a style that really came to. Uh, uh, to be instrumental in kind of like existentialist uh, novels, especially the 20th century. Like uh, one, another one that comes to mind that this obviously uh, influenced greatly is Catcher in the Rye 
which I, you know, I read that I read it in high school. Not the biggest fan of Catcher in the Rye. I think there's it's well written. I think it's uh, whereas Dostoevsky is critiquing nihilism. It it almost seems like Salinger. Salinger seems like to be a nihilist. I would say I'm not sure exactly. I haven't read his other books, um, but. Yeah, and then Taxi Driver is another one that you mentioned when we were talking before this. The film Taxi Driver, Travis Bickle, uh, everybody's f- favorite quintessential uh, 1970s uh, New York incel. Um, yeah. that, that's another work that was uh, influenced by this, a film, not a novel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that film, I mean, it really is like a play-by-play of this in a number of ways. It takes out a few scenes, but certainly with, um, what happens in the second act of this book in the second half, you know, when he goes to visit Liza, um, just like, just like old Travis does, um, in the, in the, in the film. And like, it certainly has the same sense of like, it has the same mood, the same sort of ambiance, the same, it's like this gritty, like loathing and, um, uh, what the French, what's the French word on, on we, it's got an on we, the sense of like loathing this like weird, modern purely modern sense of hatred um that is like sort of undirectable in the in the in the work and that's one of the things that you know you were just bringing up the unreliable narrator and um yeah as far as i know i mean dostoevsky certainly spearheaded the idea of the un, unreliable narrator especially like as a plot device in and and specifically in modern prose um you know that i mean consider that like okay so this book is published in 1864 and the novel is not that old when this book comes out um you know we think of like the novel as like this old sort of time tested um mode of of literature but verse was the thing for all of all of human history up until like the 17 i mean cervantes um is the first has the first novel with don quixote and then And then like a jump a few hundred years and then you get like Henry Fielding and Daniel Defoe in the 1700s. And then just a few years later, you have this book. So it's it's still a pretty new thing. And because it's so new and because like he pioneers so much in the book, the unreliable narrator, the the sort of multi, um, the multi voice voiced narrator. um, And, and, and not to mention that the first act of this book is so um, it's almost like when you bring up, um, Catcher in the Rye. That's a really good point because Catcher in the Rye, when, when I read Catcher in the Rye, I think a lot of people get this too. It's, it's like you're reading this dream language. That's not really, there's something happening, but he's speaking to us on another level, which is why it's like the perfect book for, I don't know. Uh, Lewis Jolly and West or somebody to use as a programming manual. Yeah, as I was going to say, it's like it, it's, it's catching the rye, rye is like weaponized literature in many right. ways. Yeah, and it, and it's, it's, it seems it has a very subversive feel. Uh, there's a lot of like Masonic tropes in there, especially with his, uh, his hunting cap and whatnot. Like, uh, whereas Dostoevsky was almost like an inverse subvert subversive work uh with uh, yeah. the, the the underground man like he we're looking at a man who's a former revolutionary right a repentant revolutionary uh right. and, you know actually a, a term that he uses in his book is book demons which maybe we'll we'll get into like for the next literary analysis uh his book demons he there are char- there's a character who expresses himself and considers himself a repentant free thinker right and you know anytime he uses the word free thinker in the book demons he's talking about somebody spreading blasphemy and uh, and, and subversive revolutionary thought right the, the word free thinking is now you know the term free thinking is now considered oh it's just great like you're a free thinker bro um, yeah. you know Dostoevsky turns that on his head and shows that this idea of free thinking is obviously tied in with a mockery of truth and and true and, and nihilism and Dostoevsky is uh, he's a repentant nihilist so let's let's get in a little bit of, of uh, I've got a few notes here on Dostoevsky just a little bit of background on uh, Dostoevsky, who is the author of The Underground Man, he was born 1821. Um, he became an engineer. He was born uh, 1821, went to a military engineering school, worked as an engineer for a bit, then got in, involved in some revolutionary, subversive social movements. Um, uh, he had some tragedies happen in his younger life, and after the, de- the death of his father, he actually developed seemingly very rapidly uh, epilepsy. So 
he became uh, epileptic and had, you know, obviously some difficulties with that. Uh, he was involved in this group called Petrushevsky's Circle. Petrushevsky's Circle was somewhat of a secret society, a little um, uh, free-thinking group. And in 1849, he was arrested for being part of the revolutionary activities of Petrushevsky's Circle, which involved plans for armed... Uh, uh, agitation of armed uprising in various cities throughout Russia, like we're talking armed revolution and violent revolutionaries, which um, is a theme that he will fixate on very much in his later work. And the underground man does have this, uh, the, the character of the underground man in the, uh, the uh, it notes from the underground is kind of this quintessential revolutionary type, right? Now, he's he's a little bit too weak and indecisive to take action, right? But you do see the, the, the seeds of the revolutionary type in the character of the underground man, the spite, the resentment towards culture, the, um, the, the, the nihilistic and destructive tendencies. This is something that it seems like Dostoevsky really struggled with as a young man. He was involved in these anti-Tsarist, anti-monarchy revolutionary movements. He was against the church. He was, uh, they were working on translating and spreading the works of Charles Fourier, who was a uh, utopian socialist. We talked a little bit about him when we were exploring the book um, uh, The Fire in the Minds of Men about the revolutionary spirit and the revolutionary religion. Uh, in 1848, they, uh, this group, they started using terrorism to uh, kind of push for this communist-style revolution. Uh, some of these people in the inner circle here, like Nikolai Spechnev, who was a wealthy noble aristocrat and a revolutionary atheist, uh, they were influenced by Buonarroti and Babouf's kind of uh, inner circle conspiracy of equals, secret revolutionary group within a group. And um, you, you see a character very similar to, uh, to Nikolai Spechnev in, in The Demons, uh, which we're going to talk about maybe a little bit today and, and definitely in some later, uh, later streams. Uh, they were influenced by Proudhon, by Marx, um, and were looking to bring about revolutionary activities and, and agitations. So he was a community organizer. Right? <laughs> he was right. one of the first community organizers back then. He's a member of ACORN. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that um, a couple of things um, about Dostoevsky's own life, the things that struck me the most, that strike me the most now are that, yeah, number one, he was an epileptic. Um, he was a little ep epileptic, right? Um, and that he did, he, that he, they say that he developed, like you said, his epilepsy after his father died. I, who knows if that's the case? Um, but it's certainly an interesting, it's certainly an interesting um, detail. Um, who knows what like a what happens to a young Russian man in the 19th century as far as a traumatic brain injury and in their society and what what it does to his to his worldview. Um, and I think that that combined with the fact that, you know, like you said, his arrest, um, his near execution, his witness of a guillotine. Right. He witnessed someone get guillotined. He was nearly executed and then he sent off to a gulag. Um, certainly tempers uh certainly tempers like it is that makes that sort of synthesizes the worldview that we're going to get uh in this book and in other books like brothers karamazov and i think that that contrasted with like his own his own passages and his own writing about reading itself and the importance of reading and what he you know reading play itself plays a big part uh sort of on a meta level in this in this book because he he, he goes in we'll i'm sure we'll discuss this but like he goes into these long passages about how, you know, he lived in books. He lived. Um, it was the only way that he felt that this character, the speaker of this book, feels like he's a part of something. And then at the same time, like he yearns for human contact. But then when he is in when he's in contact with other humans, he feels this like disgust and this hatred, not only with them, but with like his own former life and with himself. And so he has to sort of decipher what that means and, and where to channel his, his like his feelings and his thoughts and, and what he wants to do for the future. And that plays a, a major role in the rest of the um, in the rest of the book. Um, one thing um, that I read in this introduction is, um, you know, there's this uh, that he continuously writes the word literary 
in the book. It's one of the, there are a number of repeating words and phrases in the book and the word literary as, as well as like the beautiful and the lofty play an important role. Um, there's a, one of the major passages uh, in the book is where he discusses the idea of romanticism and his romanticism is kind of like, a, you know, being aware, being hyper aware or being like, I don't know, it's, it's like, he, he kind of calls romanticism like his red pill moment or something. I don't know what to call it in the book. Um, and then he's uh, one of the things that it says in this introduction about his own writing, which you mentioned before is this says um, the apparent lack of critical distance in the first person narrative have given many readers the impression that they, uh, that they have to do here with the direct statement of Dostoevsky's own ideological position and much commentary has been written about it. But the fact remains that because the book is written in different voices, we have we have a singular voice, but we have different voices. The, the one person is speaking in different voices, if that makes sense. Um, and that's a really pioneering thing in terms of modern prose. And it's been emulated so much. And it kind of gives us this like this insight into a human being, because like TSL, I think it was T.S. Eliot said that. Um, was it C.S. Eliot who said that, um, oh, it was James Joyce. James Joyce said that before Dostoevsky, like the novel was, the novel sucked. It, there was, the novel was just like the serialized Charles Dickens, um, you know, Victorian era, like propagandist, like just claptrap. There was nothing insightful about human beings. It was only surface level. There was nothing deep. There was nothing like even though many of those novels are about like spiritual elements, there was nothing metaphysical about them. There was nothing deeply religious. So, um, so there are a couple other um, things that some other writers, some other writers have said about, I'm going to blabber on while Tristan is getting a, uh, a, a Venezuelan mountain water. Um, some things that some other um, writers have said about Dostoevsky um, Herman Hesse, the great German novelist, uh, right? Steppenwolf said that um, Dostoevsky is like, gives a glimpse into what he called the havoc. Later on, existentialists and like Jean-Paul Sartre and these people would sort of take this and make this like gazing into the abyss. Nietzsche was fond of, of um, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche talked about how he was the only psychologist that he ever learned anything from. Of course, we have Freud and Freud's sort of misinterpretation of Dostoevsky and his work. Um, we have James Joyce again, who said that Dostoevsky created uh, modern prose. And he specifically mentions like his violence of words. And I think what he means by that is like his writing is fiery, it's passionate, and there's literal violence in the work, but the work itself is so violent because it's like visceral, it speaks to you. Um, and there wasn't really anything like that before in terms of the modern novel. Um, and also Kafka, of course, there, there's, there's a lot of Kafka. Um, in this book, um, he Kafka called Dostoevsky his blood relative. Um, there's a lot of um, the French symbolists in this book that I got, Rambeau and Baudelaire. I mean, they specifically steal passages from this book. T.S. Eliot, um, later T.S. Eliot, Rambeau and Baudelaire all steal directly from this book. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty, um, it has a lot. It's a thick book. Um, and, and And like you said, I mean, this book is like, I don't know, 100, 132 pages or something. And it's shorter than, for example, I don't know, The Great Gatsby. But I can read The Great Gatsby in like three hours. And this book takes me, can, can take me days. Um, it's just, it's so complex. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's super dense. I mean, it's a very, very right. dense book. It's beautifully written. Um, you know, the prose, it's, it, it's very jarring at times. It's a uh, you know, stream of consciousness style which it seems like Dostoevsky really uh developed that to a point of uh a really to a really brilliant level in this novel and it seems like it's something that a lot of people imitated later yeah speaking of stream of consciousness I just realized this um there's this I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking um that this book reminded me especially in the first sections of Norm Macdonald and um I realized reading it that there are specific passages that Norm took and made into jokes. And then la there are later interviews. I just know a lot. I just listened to a lot of Norm. And, um, and then 
there he did an appearance where he told like the moth joke on Conan or something and he, he used Russian names and I realized why it was that Norm um, got into Dostoevsky why I love Dostoevsky and it's because he was a gambling addict I didn't know that about Dostoevsky that he was a he was a gambling addict and so I guess Norm found a kindred spirit um, yeah and yeah and you, you you see he's he's really he's haunted by like the the um in the, in the character in the book reflects this as well is that the the um, impulsivity of kind of like our fallen nature right like this uh, this impulsive action that the character of uh, in notes from the underground takes because he's a hyper rationalistic character and he's frozen in his will like he's so he's so right rationalistic that he comes to the conclusion that to be truly rational you have to just basically be nothing right because he right. can see you know the infinite regress of uh of, of um of causes for every action and ultimately every action is meaningless to him because you know two plus two equals four everything is just two plus two equals four and he's critiquing this worldview but then at the same time he's completely trapped in it is what's amazing about this character and uh yeah you can tell that the uh you know the impulsiveness of the underground man is something that maybe was um reflected of the the author's uh worldview and where in where in which he was haunted by some of these vices that he and and also epilepsy right the the unpredictable nature and the controlling nature of something like epilepsy um which is you know to a certain to a certain degree can be controlled medically through you know keeping brain chemistry in a certain way but also there's there's an irrational aspect to that there's this irrational aspect of of suffering that that he explores in here so well so um just to just to finish up on his bio right like his you know he was he was actually sentenced to um 10 years yeah, of uh, i think it was like five years of that four or five years of that were hard labor and then six right. years of that were uh, spent remaining in exile in siberia and before this before the exile began they were sentenced to death by firing squad the group of revolutionaries uh in petrushevsky's circle i think there was like 60 or so of them um, right. They were arrested, and um, they were arrested, and actually the whole the whole theatrical uh, presentation of the firing squad they were subjected to this right. So they they lined them up. We're gonna kill you. You are dead. They read them their their um, you know their their sentence, and the rifles were pointed at them. The guns were cocked. And at the last moment, a guy comes running up with a letter. He says, stop. He waves a white flag. The rifles drop. And he said, and they read them that their sentences are being commuted and that they will be doing labor and uh, exile in Siberia. And this was done under, was it Tsar Alexander the Second? So Tsar Alexander the Second had personally uh, decided on this for this group of revolutionaries instead of execution there was uh, a, a merciful whipping essentially and um, so I think after this during his exile at some point he uh, he became repentant he was reading the New Testament it's like the only book he had was the New Testament apparently he was reading that intensively and uh, ended up becoming not just Orthodox but also a monarchist and a traditionalist and an advocate for um, traditional culture, and he was kind of adjacent to a lot of the uh, Slavophiles and the Slavophile movement, although he did critique some of their worldview uh, very scathingly, especially the kind of um, uh, elevating nationalism. Uh, he saw some of them as elevating nationalism as above God and above Christ, in which he critiqued in, uh, in the book Demons in a really prescient passage. But anyways, that's he, he changed. He, his life changed. He became a traditionalist. He became a monarchist. And he became an advocate for czarism, for traditionalism, and uh, loved Russia intensely, right? So he went from hating Russia and wanting to burn it all down and destroy it, and a nihilist, to, um, you know, uh, an Orthodox Christian, an advocate for hierarchy, which is fascinating. Yeah, I found a, um, a piece of uh, criticism literary criticism written about Dostoevsky. Um, and of course, this is from our, our, our boy, Harold Bloom here, who <laughs> is the, the uh, I guess the, 
monolithic figure of um, American letters. And I like to go back and read his criticism about some of these figures because sometimes we can find something revelatory and something spot on like we did with Melville um, when, when I did uh, Moby, Moby Dick and his, his uh, long passages about what he called like the American religion and, you know, Gnosticism as the American religion and all this. And about um, Moby Dick or, or sorry, about um, Ahab as a, um, you know, as a Luciferian figure. But here he talks about Dostoevsky. This is just a short passage. And he says, um, he says, I read him and shudder. <laughs> His obscurantism, which he calls Russian Christianity, embraces a worship of tyranny, a hatred of the United States and of all democracy, and a profound and vicious anti uh, S E M I T I S M. Uh, he loathes nihilistic terrorism, but endorses the state uh, terrorism of the Russian Empire and Church. And he says, um, he says his anti S thing is comparable to Ezra Pound. It's important to remember that Dostoevsky was an obscurantist and a supporter of czarist tyranny and Russian Orthodox theocracy. He was a vehement parodist of Westernization and firmly believed that Russians were the chosen people and that Christ was the Russian Christ. Um, that's his criticism. That's his criticism of Dostoevsky. Um, hmm. So, uh, hmm. well, uh, yeah. I agree, except, <laughs> <laughs> except, right, based. Right. No, um, <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I, I would say though that this idea of you know uh, the Russian Christ, I, I think that Dostoevsky does critique that idea of you know a nationalistic religion, or not nationalistic, as in like the post-revolutionary, um, you know, modern nationalistic, but uh, in the idea of like uh, elevating ethnicity and uh, your country, your nation over. The church and Christ and the truth, I would say Dostoevsky, from what I've seen, Dostoevsky does critique that, although he was, he did love Russia. He was a, he was well, a Russia file. It's interesting that, you know, Harold Bloom is writing from like the pinnacle of the ivory tower of Yale of, you know, the, the American letters and the American establishment and the, you know, the, 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 the pyramid of the elite in terms of, of academia and his yeah, criticism, he's a nihilist. I mean, he, he, right. he's, he's butthurt yeah. that Dostoevsky yeah. pokes and at his, nihilism. Right. And his criticism of, of Dostoevsky is that he is an Orthodox Christian, right. And that he, um, that he is critical and hates democracy, capitalism, and certain things about America, which those things, like you said, I mean, based those things, haven't those are still the same criticisms they're the same criticisms um they're the, that those are the same criticisms now that they were when bloom wrote this and that there were in the 1800s when he first wrote the when he first wrote the book you know that these things like they don't change the 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 things that people don't understand or are critical about they they don't change and even though i mean look i looked up just for fun, I looked up a YouTube video and I just did, I, I clicked on the first thing that came up and it was, um, you know, analysis of notes from the underground. And it was like, you know, it was some it was a YouTuber and she had a, a book channel and she had like, you know, five million subscribers or something. And she said she literally said, here's notes from the underground. Um, I don't really get this book like there's a guy in it and nothing happens. And for the first half of the book, like he just rambles and I don't get what he's rambling about at all. So then let's talk about the plot. And, and, it, and that was it, and, you know, and it, it had like, yeah, I mean, the plot is, is 300,000 kind of, <laughs> likes on this video. This is the, yeah, <laughs> you know? it's, it's a misunderstood book and it, it's not about the plot. Right. Although, you know, the, the plot is something, let, let, let's get into that. Let's talk a little bit about that. When we talked about Dostoevsky, the, the critiques of Dostoevsky, uh, which, you know, some people might consider those critiques, the reasons why he's so worth reading. Um, let's get into a little bit of like the, uh, the plot, the progression of ideas, the symbols in this book, because you know, you, both of us have got extensive uh, notes <laughs> in, our, in yeah. our book here. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's divided up into two portions. And that first portion really sets the stage and is very prophetic in many ways about what happens later in the novel, but then also about what happens later in our culture, right? I mean, in this book, he predicts uh, so many things, right? I mean, AI, artificial intelligence, this hyper-rationalistic uh, idea of building a global utopia based on science and reason. These are the ideas that are floating around the literary circles that he's involved in, and which is, you know, also why he uses the word literary almost ironically. Oh, it's so literary, it's so good. It's, so, uh, it's because he was hanging out with these people who were so high-minded like this and thought themselves uh, the, the intellectual elite and were discussing these ideas of, like, building building the, the global utopia based on, uh, you know, logarithmic equations that will determine every aspect of our lives. He critiques that. He, he, he predicts this. He predicts incel culture. He predicts internet troll culture with this character. He, he predicts so much about what we experience and, uh, and also shows the progression of materialist rational, uh, materialist rationalism and how this leads to denialism and to destruction, to deicide and ultimately to slow or even rapid and violent suicide. He explores these ideas of violence. He explores these ideas of, um, uh, of, of self-degradation. All these things that we see in our culture magnified to the nth degree today uh, Dostoevsky explores these ideas in his book, so we're not going to be able to do, like, I'm not going to do justice to this book. I would highly suggest that anybody w watching this or listening to this get a copy of the under uh, Notes from the Underground and, and, and read it yourself. It's something you could read many times over and take, uh, take so much from it. Um, but yeah, I guess maybe we can kind of start from the beginning and talk about the yeah. narrative because it is broken up into two parts. The first part is stream of consciousness that kind of uh, foreshadows the next uh, half of the book. And the second half of the book is a narrative from the early life of the character showing his various interactions with uh, some childhood friends of his and the, uh, the quintessential um, but also inverted romanticism of the, you know, the redeemed prostitute. You've got that, that redeemed prostitute story arc that you see in like Taxi Driver and, uh, um, and many other romantic right. works as well, as well as modern existentialist works. Um, one of the images that I noticed um, throughout this book, I mean, like you were just talking about how he keeps mentioning logarithms and, um, and we can't help but think of AI and, and sort of enumeration and the, I mean, he almost specifically, he doesn't call it the Internet of Things, but he talks about the idea that everything will be quantified. Um, and one of the things that I got from this was that from the very beginning of the book, um, it's got a really famous opening. Um, he said he starts off with, I'm a sick man, right? I'm a sick man. I'm a wicked man, an unattractive man. I think my liver hurts. However, I don't know a thing about my sickness and I'm not sure what it is that hurts me, which is like this. It's already funny. Because he's, it's almost like if he were a little bit older, he would be a carmudgeon, right? But the, but he's supposed to be 40 years old. And he says he's not being treated and he's ne he never has been, though I respect Out of spite, medicine. right? Out of spite, he won't get treated right. as if it's going to hurt the doctors. Right. Yes. No, sir. I refuse to be treated out of spite, to suffer in this case from spite. But still, if I don't get treated, it is out of spite. He repeats the word. Um, he then goes on to talk about how he doesn't accept bribes. So he had to reward myself, uh, at least with that. And then they, they translate this word into swagger in the book. Uh, I had a vile wish to swagger. I purposely won't cross it out. And he's commenting. It's interesting because we see the speaker at the beginning who we, we learn is like speaking from like a chink in the wall or like from a crawl space or like, you know, it's like, we're on the other side of Plato's cave or something. Yeah, well, this is the symbol of underground man, right? It's like yeah, it's like right. he lives in the in the attic. He's a basement dweller, right? He's the right. he's the the so you know the the basement dwelling incel right. that the media is and trying to get you to be so afraid of. That's really interesting about the basement dweller and the incel, you know, in the basement because especially later on in the final passages of the book, he mentions uh, when he's with Liza, he talks about how he's talking to her from behind a screen. Now, he literally means that like they're in the same room and she has a screen and, you know, they're, they're separated by a screen. But I couldn't help but think of the metaphor is so it 
speaks to us now that like we have this guy who is who is trying to communicate with another human being, but it's from behind a screen, right? Yeah. And he's like, and his and his his insistence on being alone and speaking from this unknown, like you know, nameless place, but reaching out and speaking into the void and then possibly connecting with human beings, but then needing, he has the need to physically go out and meet his old school friends, which happens later in the, in, in part two, he, he wants to physically go out and meet his old school friends who hate him. Right. But he decides to meet him anyway. And they, they play tricks on him. They gaslight him. They tell him, Oh yeah, we're meeting at six o'clock. Um, and then he, you know, or five o'clock and he shows up at five and then they change the time to six. So he's the early one. And they're well, like, they, they, to be to be fair to his school friends, they hate him uh, for for good reason. I mean, he he hates them, well, and he's do. and and we don't yeah. know that they actually hate him. They they actually allow him to come, right? They allow him yeah. to, uh, to 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 they, they spend time with him, but they tell him at one point, "Well, why do you even want to come? Don't, I thought you don't like." Um, was was the uh, Zerkov right? I thought we thought you hate Zerkov. Uh, right. Why would you even want to come to this going away party for him? You despise the man. So like he he sees everybody through this, like you mentioned, this screen right. There's this screen in between him and the other characters that he puts there, and he's filtering his interactions through the screen, and then also in a in a, in a way of in a vain and uh, like he uses the term vain glorious at one point to talk about. Uh, how 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 um uh, how delusional he is because he's constantly telling himself how they feel, and then the right. way that he tells himself they feel about him informs how he treats them, and it's this constant reflection. And you mentioned uh, in your notes right about the the, the mirror right, and the yeah. the screen kind of is this mirror, and yeah. you know the, this is a time when people didn't have televisions people didn't have uh skype and zoom people didn't have right. youtube but he very much is a character that is you see it reflected in the you know the 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 spiteful loner making youtube videos yes. and, and doing self-therapy talking to himself in youtube videos right the guy who doesn't talk to people in real life but talks about them on his youtube video the the the, the, right. the internet troll type character which is, you know, the word internet troll is kind of fake and gay these days. It's so overused. Same with incel, right? But this really does, it predicts this culture, this, this isolation, uh, this, this, uh, this self-degradation that happens in this isolation, um, and the fantasy world that people will be engaging to, uh, uh, with others through this screen, this false reality, and this mirror that they are reflecting themselves onto other characters with. And this is a result of the character's isolation, which is a result of his own action, right? He's not isolated because, oh, we live in a society, bro. You know, although, although that there's an aspect of that that's true, that like, you know, Dostoevsky did invent the quote, we live in a society in many ways. He, he's one of the, he, <laughs> no, I, I don't think he actually says that, but uh, he, he, his writing does, hold a mirror up to the culture that was no, St. Petersburg, right? And he, when he's with his friends, though, and he's, like, at the party, and he's, like, he's angry because, like, they're all drinking champagne or they're getting drunk or whatever. They're having a good time. And he's, like, I was over here and, like, I wanted to say something to him, right? Because then I, they were talking about, like, issues and they were talking about politics and how they, how dare they even mention Shakespeare, man? And I just wanted to say to him, society, you know. Well, he's well at that point. It's so hilarious because in that scene, he's pacing for three hours, right? So right. he he has this yeah. outburst and he he gets drunk at the dinner. He has this yeah. outburst against his friends, and this is of course wow. the second half, right? After he muses on and on about how oh I'm so intelligent, I'm hyper conscious. Consciousness is a disease, and I have the most consciousness, so I'm the most disease, and I'm proud of my disease. It's like it's this very yeah. the progression of the ideas. It's so. It's so beautifully reflective of a narcissistic nihilist, right? Who, right. who, who sees everything as meaningless, but of course has this intense love for his own uh, distorted reflection, right? And so, so everything's right. meaningless except, of course, well, you know, the words I'm saying are not meaningless. I'm brilliant. I'm literary. I'm a man of culture, and I'm a westernized, <laughs> cultured man of Saint Petersburg, which I hate and think it's an artificial culture. And but I'm but I'm a product of this, and I'm the highest pinnacle of intellectual activity here, right? So the the, the just the, the image of Saint Petersburg in the book as well. That that is a powerful symbol of. I mean, he calls it an artificial city. Right. He's like, 
there are some artificial cities and there are natural cities. And St. Petersburg is an artificial city, of course, right? He, um, he see, St. Petersburg is, uh, of course, it was built by Peter the Great on the back of the, uh, on, the, uh, on the blood and bones of a bunch of Cossacks. You know, I mean, thousands of men died building this city in a swamp, in a marsh, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Masonic city, right? So uh, Peter the Great, who tried to destroy the church, tried to uh, destroy monasticism uh, unsuccessfully, thank God. And uh, he, he built this city on the, the bones of slave labor. And he wanted this to be a window to the West, right? So the, the St. Petersburg is the setting of this book. And he, he calls it artificial, right? Yet he, he lives in this artificial world, right? So he's, he's haunted by it. He critiques it. But he, doesn't, he can't see from outside of it. He can't, he can't, um, he, he can only relate to it through negation, right? It's just, a, it's a yes. spite. Yes, yes. Um, and he's, when he, beca- I mean, right away in the beginning, we, we know that he's unreliable. He tells us so. Um, he says, he has this great, what is that? Um, Schrodinger's cat. What is it where um, I'm telling the truth? My former statement was a lie. What is that? Um, it's axiomatic. I can't remember. He says, and I lied about myself. I'm foaming at the mouth. Um, he says, give me some tea and a bit of sugar and maybe I'll calm down. I'll wax tenderhearted though. Afterwards, I'll certainly gnash my teeth at myself and suffer from insomnia for a few months out of shame. Such is my custom. And I lied about myself just now when I said I was a wicked official, I lied out of wickedness. I was simply playing around. So it's like, what, what do we, what do we to make of this guy? He's, he's wicked, but then he is like less wicked for telling us the truth. But then he says, no, that was wicked because I was lying to you. But right now I'm telling you the truth. Um, oh, and also um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, what, how, what are we to make of this guy? Right. Um, you know, it's funny in, in my, in my translation, I kind of prefer, I don't know, maybe I just prefer it. Cause this is the one I read. Yeah. Let me, I'll read you the first line and you'll see how they translate it here. He, he starts, I, I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unpleasant man. I think my liver is diseased. However, I don't know beans about my disease, and I'm not sh- quite sure what is bothering me. I don't treat it and never have, though I respect medicine and doctors. Besides, I am extremely superstitious, let's say sufficiently so to respect medicine. So it, 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 it's, does it spiteful here rather than wicked, which yes. I, I kind of like the, the, the spiteful, and, and maybe every time they translate it, because spiteful comes up a lot in, in yeah. the translation I've got here, and um, yeah, the, they, they do spiteful. So then in the next portion, which you're talking about, the, he says, well, I lied when I said I was spiteful. I couldn't even be spiteful because I couldn't be anything. I couldn't even decide to be a worm, right? He's like, I could, he, he has this inaction, this frozenness of his will due to hyper-rationalization. Right. Yeah, I think that, um, I think the, with any translation, I mean, the, the problem is that there's, I think with the word, Forgive me if you're if you're a Russian and you're watching this, but the word that they're they're translating from um, has no you know there's no cognate there's and there's no direct you know English translation and so they're trying to I like your version better actually but um, the the word spiteful and, uh, or spite is mentioned so many times and even in mine but I think that the translators here are trying to they're trying to decipher in terms of the context when he's being wicked and when, when he's talking about wickedness and when he's talking about spite. And certainly in the opening line, he's talking about spite. I, I agree that it shouldn't have been wickedness because wickedness is something altogether different than spite, isn't it? Right. When he talks later, he talks about like revenge, right? And he's like, well, right. how can I take revenge? Because the very act of taking revenge would basically assume some sort of morality when I'm right. only mad because two plus two equals four. And if I take revenge, I'm not, there is no real, there is no justice. So how can right. I, how can I enact justice, right? So he has this, this, uh, this very nihilistic worldview. So he doesn't even really believe in wickedness, although he does wax poetic about how, you know, people shouldn't treat him this way and how he always feels slighted, right? Like he, he, he at one point he says, um, you know, he, he, he can, he calls himself like a rat, <laughs> right? He says, um, yes. where is that? I, well, he says, uh, is this the passage? 
Take, for instance, I am terribly vain. I am suspicious and touchy as a hunchback or a dwarf. But to tell the truth, there have been moments when if someone had happened to slap my face, I would perhaps have even been glad of that. I say very seriously that I would probably have even been able to discover a peculiar sort of enjoyment, even in that, the enjoyment, of course, of despair. But in despair uh, occur the most intense enjoyments, especially when one is very acutely conscious of one's hopeless position. So that, that wasn't actually the quote I was looking for, but I mean, it does expand on the character there, right? How vain he is and how he, he seeks self-degradation. And he talks about this. He says, in the, when, in the moments when I'm experiencing, he might have used the, you know, the, they, they, they translate it here as the, uh, the beautiful and the sublime, right? right. Which is kind yeah. of like, like Rousseau, was that Rousseau? Not Rousseau. Who was it that, um, that used that statement? It's some kind of like a in you know enlightenment idea of you know the beautiful and the sublime and he wasn't it Rousseau? I thought I think it was I think it was Rousseau because it, it talks about le homme de nature de la vérité like the the man of truth and nature um, when he's kind of ripping on Rousseau there but he he says um, that when he feels this beautiful feeling he feels love or expansiveness or the beautiful and the sublime that he will instantly want to do something disgusting and do something vile to destroy right. it. Yeah, sometimes it, feel good, it feels good to smash things, he says. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's certainly um, one of the things that struck me in this was that this like 19th century um, romantic ideal of, um, you know, truth, beauty, and goodness um, or, or truth, beauty, and goodness for their own sake as rebelling against like the Enlightenment era, um, the, the, the Enlightenment era ideas of like reason and reason and rationale is something that it, it's like they try, it's like in a lot of literature, especially in like French symbolist literature and in, in some of the like more political um, literature of the British romantic poets, you get this sort of like, even though they're they're verbalizing what they want to rebel against, there's not they're not actually vocalizing it. It's just this general sense of, you know, we've been we've been everything's been quantified and we're put into this box and, and now we have, you know, symmetrical Doric columns on everything and we're supposed to be in this neoclassical era, but we want to go out into nature and rebel. And that's sort of where you get like this Byronic hero idea. And certainly like it's weird that, you know, that Dostoevsky has like a, he's, he writes in the same vein sometimes and he, he sort of in, in, encapsulates those ideals, but he's also completely different. His, his own writing is so thoroughly Russian, right? So and we know that like in his biography, I mean, he, he took like a grand tour of Europe. He saw, you know, he saw he went to France. He, this is where he gets the idea of the Crystal Palace. From yeah, that was because in, in London, right? He went to London. He saw right. this. It was was it like 1851. Actually, in the in the version I've got here, there is a passage from uh, some letters that he wrote about yeah. the Crystal Palace, and he compares yeah. it to Baal. He says this is Baal yeah. worship, and then you get this. It, he, he was horrified by the Crystal Palace, which was a it was actually a a, a, a giant like chamber made of crystal and steel and yes. um it was erected in london it ended up burning down in like 1936 which is so fascinating um and it was a symbol of the enlightenment it was a symbol of reason it was a symbol of utopianism the crystal palace of equality fraternity liberty you know this uh conquering of nature and a building of a perfect rational order and he saw this thing and was he thought it was demonic basically yes yeah i got that passage this is um chapter seven of the book um and he starts off chapter seven by speaking um and this one it says but these are all golden dreams tell me who first announced who was the first to proclaim that man does dirty only because he doesn't know his real interests and that were he to be enlightened were his eyes to be open to his real normal interest, man would immediately stop doing dirty, would immediately become good and noble. Because being enlightened and understanding his real profit, he would see his real profit precisely in the good. And it's common knowledge that no man can act knowingly against his own profit, consequently out of necessity, so to speak. He would start doing good. Oh, the babe, he says. Oh, the pure, innocent child, right? You, you're, you poor fool, you naive fool. 
he goes on to say, um, he says, moreover, then you say, science itself will teach man, though this is really a luxury, in my opinion, that in fact, he has neither will nor um, caprice, and never did he have any, and that he himself is nothing but a sort of piano key or a sprig and an organ. And that furthermore, there also exists in the world the laws of nature, so that whatever he does is done not all according to his own wanting, but of itself according to nature. And then a few, a few sentences later, he says, all human actions will then be calculated according to these laws, mathematically, like a table of logarithms up to 108,000 entered into a calendar, or better still, some well-meaning publication will appear, like the present day encyclopedic dictionaries, uh, that there will no longer be any actions or adventures in the world, then the crystal palace will get built. So what he's saying there, what, the way I read this was, oh, this is like a few pages into chapter seven of the book, is that he's saying, he's, I mean, he's, this is a prediction of now, right? I mean, you've talked about here so much, like you've done so much analysis and coverage of, you know, the, the internet of things, of AI, of, of all the different variations of, of transhumanism and how they appear in all the varieties of, of you know, society and government and all. And, and I think that this, this struck me because what he's saying here is that science and reason, right? Sci scientism will, is be, will become this thing where everything will be quantified. Everything that you, everything that you think and, and feel will be predicted for you. And that this will be when this crystal palace will get built, this, this figurative crystal palace, which will be, like you said, he calls it, a, a temple to ball, right? Um, and he says, why don't they, uh, well, gentlemen, why don't we reduce all this reasonableness to dust with one good kick for the sole purpose of sending all these logarithms to the devil and living once more according to our own will? In other words, it's like, we're going to do all this stuff and everybody's going to be a part of this. And then, you know, you can just knock it all away, wash it all away, and then we can start over how we want to. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, pointing out this the irrational impulse of man, right? So uh, the Crystal Palace is the ultimate result of of rationality, right? I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. what he's saying here and what, you know, what I've been saying on this channel for so long now is that this scientific rationalism, this doesn't mean, you know, you throw science, you throw reason out the door, but the like deification of like scientific rationalism as a worldview. Right. Um, this leads to technocracy. This leads to, I mean, Dostoevsky in his book, The Demons, there's a character, he says, um, he's waxing poetic about his theories on how to rearrange society and culture. And he's like, we live in a society, man. Uh, no, he doesn't say that. He, he, says, he says, you know, well, it, it ended up being contradictory because I began with infinite freedom and I resulted in complete uh, despotism. So he's, yeah. uh, the starting point is infinite freedom and we end with infinite despotism. And I don't, there's no other way that we can do this. The character ends up saying the only way to do this, we have to kill a hundred million people. We have to destroy as many of you, as much of humanity as possible. And he ends up saying, yes, the, uh, and this is in the, the, the book demons, which maybe we'll get into uh, uh, another episode or maybe a several episode series that he says that, um, this is the only rational way. And then we'll have 10% of the population will live as scientifically and, uh, and, and have fully automated luxury communism, basically. And then 90% of the population will, be, uh, will just be the cattle. Is, is what this character says um, in, in the book, The Demons. But yeah, he, I, I love the, the, the passage you just read is one of the most important passages here. And right? he says, he says, all human actions will of course be tabulated according to these laws, mathematically, like laws, uh, like tables of logarithms up to 108,000 and entered into a table or better still, there would be published certain edifying works like the present encyclopedic lexicons in which everything will be so clearly calculated and designed that there will be no more incidents or adventures in the world. So he says, uh, so that every possible question will vanish in a twinkling simply because every possible answer to it will be provided. Then the Crystal Palace will be built. So you'll have no freedom, but you will be happy. He, and then he says, no, that's not how it will be because man has an irrational aspect to him, which of course, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, uh, get to expand on in this book, but it does seem like there was something that was removed from, I think it was like chapter 10. And he was lamenting that the censors uh, actually, you know, uh, 
actually removed one of his favorite parts from this book. And the quote about the censors, I actually had, where is that? I had a quote about the censors and how they removed one of his favorite passages from the book where he reconciles this idea and, and the character re recognizes that you need, uh, that nihilism cannot be the starting point, that determinism, nihilism, materialist, rationalism is destructive and that you actually need Christ. Now I'm trying to find, where did that go? I had this um, quote, let me just find this, because this is really important. And when you realize what the censors actually removed, you'll realize that Dostoevsky was, he was in so many ways very prophetic about what was happening he was in so many ways very prophetic about what was happening, and also he um, he knew what was happening around him, not just what was to come, but he knew what was happening around him. And he yes. said, um, "While you're looking for that passage, yeah. did you notice that there was a passage in chapter three that specifically it reminded me a lot of? Do you remember when you did the stream? You showed the video of the like MK Ultra mouse experiments." Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that appears in chapter three, um, and he says um, he's talking about uh, base desires, nasty little base desires, and throughout this book, I mean, um, you guys, if you're watching this, he he has so many metaphors um, to like forward his push his world, you know, that express his worldview, um, the speaker's worldview throughout this, and one, you know, we get the mouse. One of those is the wall. Um, Chapter three, he talks about the wall and he says, um, he says, uh, what happens for instance, people who know how to take revenge and how to stand up for themselves. They're overcome say by vengeful feeling. Then for the time, there's simply nothing left in their whole being, but this feeling. And then they're like an enraged bull, but that is uh, before a wall, these gentlemen, that is um, ingenious people and active figures quite sincerely fold. He says they fold in all sincerity. Um, I envy such a man to the point of extreme bile. He is stupid. Perhaps it's even beautiful, he says. And then on the next page, he, he talks about the mouse. He says, let us now have a look at this mouse in action. Suppose, for instance, that it too is offended and it's almost always offended and it wishes to take revenge. For it may have, it may have stored up even more spite. The nasty, base little desire to pay the offender back with the same evil scratch may still more nastily in it with his innate stupidity, um, regards his revenge quite simply as justice, whereas the mouse, as a result of his heightened consciousness, denies it any justice. Things finally come down to the business itself, to the act of revenge itself, and then it sinks, he says. He goes on to talk about how it sinks back into its stinking, loathsome underground, and it immerses itself in cold and venom and everlasting spite. And that's not only, that's not only his metaphor for... I don't know, I guess the wider world, humanity in general, as he sees it, but also for himself, because he's the one who's underground, it's like reflexive. But it's also, um, I, I just found it interesting that that was, that is a, that metaphor became reality. It became an actual thing in terms of measuring. If you go back and you guys, if you go back and watch Tristan's video on that, it's like you, you watch these, these, depraved MK Ultra experiments on like using the mouse as they as the avatar for the human being and watch what happens and how we can anatomize man and predict every sort of outcome or situation he's in right look what will happen with the external stimulus look what will happen here um, look what will happen there it's crazy <laughs> um, did you find your passage Yeah, you know, let, let's expand on that a little bit more, and then I'll get back. I did find the yeah. quote, and then we could talk about yeah. the the censorship later, maybe, uh, and and tie that in because um, there was there was another segment here um, about where he's he's kind of waxing poetic about the um, the utopia. So he he talks about you know. Rational egoism was like a big movement at the time, right? This idea that like, oh, if everybody just works in their enlightened self-interest, that uh, then everybody will act rationally and we'll build the crystal palace, we'll build the utopia, we'll build the uh, every you know you will own nothing and be happy world. Um, he he critiques this in a brilliant way here, and he talks about how reason is essentially 
very irrational. <laughs> man man right. uses and manipulates reason in order to um, justify his will. So it's like this, this idea of reason and this idea of free will. Those are constantly battling in this uh, through the, the consciousness of this character here. So it says... Um, uh, Chapter 8, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, I'm not sure. So he says it may be monotonous too. They fight and fight. They're fighting now. They fought first and they fought last. You will admit that it is almost too monotonous. In short, one may say anything about the history of the world, anything that might enter the most disordered imagination. The only thing one cannot say is that it is rational. The very word sticks in one's throat. And, indeed, this is even the kind of thing that continually happens. After all, there are continually turning up in life moral and rational people, sages and lovers of humanity, who make it their goal for, uh, for life to live as morally and rationally as possible, so to, so, be, so to speak, a light to their neighbors, simply in order to show them that it is really possible to live morally and rationally in this world. And so what? We all know that those very people, sooner or later, towards the end of their lives, have been false to themselves, playing some trick trick, often a most indecent one. Now I ask you, what can one expect from man, since he is a creature endowed with such strange qualities? Shower upon him every earthly blessing, drown him in bliss, so that nothing but bubbles would dance on the surface of his bliss, as on a sea, give him such economic prosperity that he would have nothing else to do but sleep, eat cakes, and busy himself with ensuring the continuation of uh, world history. And even then, man, out of sheer ingratitude, sheer libel, would play you some loathsome trick. He would even risk his cakes and would deliberately desire the most fatal rubbish, the most uneconomical absurdity, simply to, to introduce into all this positive rationality his fatal, fatalistic element. Um, that's that's one of my favorite passages there. Just yeah. the, you know, drown him in bubbles of, what is it? Uh, drown him in bliss so that nothing but bubbles would dance on the surface of his bliss. Um, this this idea, we're gonna, we will drown you in happiness. You, you will be so free. We will drown you in your freedom and you will only be able to be happy. So this, um, you know, this is soon after he was discussing the hyper-rationalistic logarithmic prediction of all behaviors and a reasoning uh, and reason leading to an ordering of all of man's life. Um, it's this idea of free will drowned in the bubbles of forceful happiness. And I think this really, this is one of the best critiques of rationalism uh, as a, you know, guiding principle and as the basic principle of life as if man is just a reasonable creature. Uh, clearly, man has this aspect of him that will irrationally seek destruction, right? Which is what he explores later in the book, Demons, which, you know, spoiler alert, that's what brings man to destruction. This rejection of God, this rejection of Christ, this rejection of love, of true, real life is what the character here in the under, in Notes from the Underground is struggling with. And that brings me to the, uh, the quote about Dostoevsky's censors, right? So he was so upset because... Um, the, the censors actually removed one of his favorite parts from the book. And as he's critiquing the revolutionary worldview, as he's critiquing nihilism, uh, the censors at the press showed themselves to be nihilists, showed themselves to be revolutionaries because, here's a quote from Dostoevsky writing to his, uh, one of his close confidants. He says, the censors, those swine, passed the part of the work where I jeered at everything and sometimes blasphemed for the sake of appearances, but the part where I derived from all this the necessity of faith in Christ, that has been deleted. So they deleted his Christian segments from the book in order to publish the revolutionary worldview that he was critiquing and, 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 and not provide the fullness of the critique that he wanted to provide. So I think that's really telling. They also did this later in the book Demons. Uh, the censors removed an important passage, an important chapter uh, involving a confession to a former bishop that one of the characters uh, kind of uh, revealed much about himself and his uh, and what was really driving him in his in his behaviors in that book. So um, yeah, the censors who published his book, just like the media today, were subversives, were revolutionaries. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he goes on in that in that passage you mentioned. Um, 
to talk about the piano key. Um, and I mean, he spent in this translation, they, they mentioned, you know, um, atomization, right? Atomization of man. And in chapter nine, the piano key, by the way, sorry, reading this, um, you guys, piano key reminded me of the, it says, and more than that, even if it should indeed turn out that he is a, a piano key, if it were even proved to him mathematically in my natural science, he would still not come to reason, but would do something contrary on purpose solely out of ingratitude alone. He talks about ingratitude um, a, a few, a, quite a few times in powerful passages in the book. One is, um, let's see, he talks about. When he calls or, man like the, the ungrateful biped or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, where is it? Um, so oh, here it is, here it is. Um, he says, this is chapter, still chapter eight. Yeah, he says, um, uh, human nature acts as an entire whole with everything that's in it, consciously and unconsciously. And though it lies, it still lives, he says. Um, and he says, the chiefest and dearest thing that is our personality and our individuality. Now, some insist that this is indeed the dearest of all things for man. Wanting may, of course, converge with reason if it wants, especially if this is not abused, but is done with moderation. It's both useful and sometimes even praiseworthy. But wanting is very often, even for the most part, completely and stubbornly at odds with reason. And, and, and he says, do you know this too is useful and sometimes even quite praiseworthy? Suppose, gentlemen, that man is not stupid. Really, it is quite impossible to say he is for the sole reason that if he is stupid, who then is intelligent? But even if he isn't stupid, all the same, he's monstrously ungrateful, he says. Phenomenally ungrateful. I even think the best def definition of man is a being that goes on two legs and is ungrateful. That's the biped, right? Um, he says, um, yeah, we can do a whole bunch of things. Like, we can be majestic, right? We can make, he says, the Col Colossus of Rhodes is majestic, LOL. Um, but so what he says, right. Um, and then he goes on, um, yeah, to talk about how man can be reduced to like, he says, but what if we're just a piano key? What if we're, what if we're just a keyboard key, right? What if we're reduced to strokes on a keyboard in chapter nine, he says, um, but how do you know that man not only can be, but must be remade in this way? What makes you conclude that man's wanting so necessarily needs to be corrected? Yeah, yeah, I like that passage. I really like That's that. Because it was like, on, on what basis are we going to rebuild man? And why are we going to rebuild man? So he's, right. he, the, the, the transhumanist movement that we see now, this is what it's all about, right? Man can be anything he wants, right? And, and the underground man kind of talks about this idea before, but he's, he's paralyzed in his will. He says, I couldn't even become an insect. He says, I couldn't even yeah. be spiteful because I couldn't do anything, right? And he's, it's all just two plus two equals four and the laws of nature are what make man do anything right no, at the same time he's, he's he's struggling with these ideas and he's refuting these ideas and he's lashing out at these ideas but unfortunately the underground man doesn't have a worldview that's able to actually contend with these ideas beyond just clashing with them beyond just sheer opposition and he defines himself not as the man of truth and action or the man of action he calls him which he he which is like you know the the he he he, he contrasts himself to with like uh, these soldiers, right? Men, men of action and soldiers in the civil service that he lives around. These men who are distinguished, who he feels jealousy and spite towards because they have material uh, goods. And he sees that just being bestowed upon them by nature, not, as, but not, not because of any virtue of themselves. Well, nature just gave them this money, right? And he sees, you know, money is a major symbol in the book as well. And he's always needs, he needs money in order to do these things, to engage with the superficial world that he says he hates, right? He has to borrow money to even, uh, to go to dinner with his friends, right? And he feels spiteful right. towards the person who gives him this money. He has to pay his servant, Apollon. Uh, he's got his servant that he lives with, who he hates and says that he's, he literally says, I hate him. He's the worst person. He's the bane of my existence. And this guy who does yeah. nothing but serve him, who does nothing but help him. And he hates him and he has to, he has to pay him and he despises him that he has to pay him. Right. And he's, so he's borrowing money in order to engage with the, uh, the world in, 
in a in a very degenerate way, right? He goes and he gets drunk. He goes and he buys a coat at one point before he goes and uh, to this party with his friends. And one of the funniest passages, he he goes and he like he he's seething about this officer. He sees these guys battling it out, having a bar fight. And he's like, I want to, I want to do that. I want to go in that bar and I want to get in a fight. And he goes to the billiard table and he tries to pick a fight. Oh, dude and, gets thrown out a window. Right? A dude gets done. Yeah. And he says, man, if only I could be thrown out a window, but I can't even do that. The screen. I can't even do that. The, the broken right, screen. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Right. <laughs> He's like, I couldn't even get, and he tries to get thrown out the window. Couldn't even do that. The guy just picks him up and moves him to the side because he's like, a, <laughs> he's a little manlet, right? He's a bitter, irra- he was a bitter, hyper rationalistic, nihilistic little manlet. And he just wants to get punched in the face. And he talks about this many times. He's like, I've, I, I couldn't even get slapped in the face because I'm not even worth getting slapped in the face. I'm not even like a fly to these people. And he's so bitter towards them. We, and again, we don't really know how these people feel about him. He does, you know, they, they do, the world does seem to pity him, to look down upon him to a certain extent. But a lot of it's just projection of his own emotion, a projection of how he sees himself. He hates himself. He's demonically influenced to despise himself, to negate himself, and to constantly degrade himself. So he goes to try to degrade himself in one of these, what he calls filthy nights, right? He says the, the nights in St. Petersburg are disgusting, he calls them. <laughs> and he, but he revels in the disgust, and he says that the next day he even feels this sweetness about the gross, disgusting things he'd done the night before, which, you know, he, he, he ends up going to a whorehouse at one point. Um, but he, he tries to get beat up. He tries to get in a fight. The dude just picks him up and lifts him to the side, and, um, and, he, and he hates him for that. And then he's seething. He's, he's, he copes and seethes over this for so long, right? And he, he, he follows the dude home and, like, figures out his name somehow through spying on him from afar and watching him and just creeping on him. And he devises this great plan about how he's going to get equal with him. And his great plan is essentially that he's going to, he fantasizes about, um, about bumping into him, right? Because yes. he's always, he's, he's, he calls himself like a worm and he goes through the crowd like a worm. And he says, well, I'm going to be equal with this, uh, with this uh, officer. And I'm going to, bump into him and I'm not going to budge, right? Because the world's always telling me that I should budge and I'm always slunking down to the world, but I'm going to stand and I'm going to use my will. I'm going to bump into him. So he has this kind of fantasy of like violence, right? Like he he fantasizes about a a very weak and effeminate and passive aggressive act of pseudo violence, right? And he he does fantasize at other times about killing people, right? And and he has these ideas of, oh, you're so mad at this whore at one point. I could have killed her uh, because she showed him love, uh, really and but he 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 has this fantasy about about clashing with the world and it, it like the metaphor of the wall that you brought up earlier which i wonder if if pink floyd if they weren't influenced a little bit by dostoevsky and that in their album the wall and the symbol of the wall as this rationalistic pillar of of uh of 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 um hyper tyrannical conformity and um uh, which he which he uh, says is basically just two plus two equals four, right? Two plus two equals four is everything, but I hate two plus two equals four, he says. I want to bash up against it, but I can't because I'm just the result of that, right? He wants to bash up against the officer, and he has to borrow money <laughs> to get a coat because he has to be wearing this special coat in order to feel distinguished, right? And he wants to rub shoulders and bash shoulders with the officer. Um, sorry, I'm, yeah, kind, I'm kind of rambling there, but... The- no, I think the the wall. Um, the way I thought of the wall, yeah, you can't help but think of Pink Floyd, obviously, uh, for sure. You know, when you're reading it, um, I think the wall is interesting because, you know, we often think of like the wall as the thing that, you know, the wall is the thing that separates you um, from. It's like you put the wall up to keep the people out, right? Is the ba- you know the obvious sort of basic level. Um, a symbolic interpretation of the wall. But in terms of this novel, it's almost like when he talks about the wall, it's almost like the wall is the walled si- is the walls of the city. And so he talks about, I mean, you mentioned earlier about St. Saint, Saint Petersburg being, you know, the, the, the fake city, the, the constructed city. And it's like, and then along with like the crystal palace, it's like, this guy's so locked up in himself. He has no deliverance. He's got no salvation. He doesn't have God. He can't, he can't be delivered from, from this, like, this, this like fog that he's in 
just like he can't escape the city. He doesn't, there's nothing outside of himself. And when he goes to the outside, it's like he's, he projects all of his, all, all of it, the intentions and, and the feelings and all the stuff that other, the other people. So what, like the thing about walking down the street, it's like, he, you just said like, he sees himself as this like worm, like worming through. The, I mean, he talks about that in the text. He uses the worm a number of times and he's like worming through the crowd. But how does he know that the person coming at him isn't just like he wants to. So this is okay. So the way this spoke to me was like, this is kind of weird, but when I was in, um, I went to drama school, right? When I went to drama school in the UK and in, in British drama school, and they teach you about, you know, your how to walk and how to, you know, how to be on stage and, you know, your, your physical presence and embodying a character and all that stuff. One of the first things they teach you um, when you get there is how to enter a room and like how to walk down the street. This sounds really weird, and like esoteric, but what they say is that like, they're basically like, look, when you, when you walk down a street now, you're nothing, right? You move out of the way of people. You, everyone's better than you, but we're going to teach you to be an actor and you're going to carry yourself in such a way that by the time you're finished here, you know, you'll be able to walk down the street and people will sense your, you know, like sensing your alpha power or whatever. Yeah, like that. That, that's what he's, he's fantasizing about this, right? Like, I'm going to be like the officer. I'm going to be, people exactly. are going like, to, I'm going to, I'm going to be strong. Yeah. I'm going to be willful. Right. And that is an, uh, that is an interesting, you know, next time, if you're watching this, next time you're like in a city, if you're in a city and there are people walking around, uh, walk down the street and see who moves out of the way first when you're walking down the street. You know, are you the are you the confident man walking down the street and people are moving out of the way for you? Or, you know, that doesn't I'm not saying are you, you know, are you not courteous? You know, don't bump into some poor later lady when you knock her into the into the, into the gutter when you're when you're walking through the city. But that's the whole point of what he's saying here. Right. And the thing about like when he goes and hangs out with his old school friends, this to me is like, you know, so, somebody once said to me like, okay, you remember, remember that poor kid at school who, you know, everybody picked on or whatever. I went to a boys, you know, private school. And, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, you, you look back and you think, man, school is tough and it's vicious and it's everyone's out for themselves. But then somebody had a good point. They're like, you know, that that may have happened, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't like two sided. It wasn't symbiotic. You know, it wasn't this guy does this. He goes to the party and it's like they let him into the party. Right. They they yes, they do the thing about changing the time and they do all that stuff. But he's at the party. But like like you said, like he's pacing around for three hours and he's just trying to criticize them for something and then but it's so all... funny because he's telling himself that he's telling himself the whole time that they're useless to him and that he he's he's making it a point to pace around in a way where they will think that he doesn't notice them but all the while he's conscious of them and watching them so it's a hilarious passage yeah. it's so he's so schizophrenic in the moment he's, he's like psychotic yeah. And when he drinks, when he finally, you know, he's like, oh, they're all drinking. They're drinking champagne. And then when he finally drinks, he gets drunk. And then the other guys at the party are like, oh, you drunk, bro? You know, like, yeah. he just can't. The guy's just awkward. He just can't. He just can't handle himself, you know? He's socially he's retarded. Just, he's, 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 he's so up in his own head. And he's so delusional. Just, I mean, he's, he's tortured. He's a tortured yeah. man. He's tortured by... The demons that uh, that he carries around with him that uh, that he that he allows to influence him. But he is aware, though, in a way that is pretty. I mean, it's it's insightful. Like when he when he talks about being an insect in chapter nine, he talks about like, oh, you know, if I could be, you know, an insect, you know, because insects are. And this was obviously like a Kafka Kafka, you know, this reminds a reader of Kafka. Um, with the metamorphosis, but like he talks about like, oh, if I could just be an ant and be nothing. Right. But then he says, um, he says, why does he, uh, but why does he so passionately love destruction and chaos as well? Talking about man. And then he says, but wait a minute, like um, achieving the goal and completing the edifice he's creating. And by no means, maybe he only likes creating it and not living it. So he talks about the ants have the same remarkable edifice of the same sort, forever indestructible, the ant hill. He says, with the anthill, the most worthy ants began, and with the anthill, they will all doubtless end as well, which does great credit to their constancy and positiveness, he says, uh, which is, uh, of course, is bound to be nothing other than two times two is four, 
That is a formula, and two times four is no longer, gentlemen, from the beginning of death. So he says, like, even the ants, you know, can create something beautiful. Um, they may not live in it, but they know how to create something, right? But he can't even be that. He says, whether it's good or bad, it's sometimes, it's also, oh, here's the famous passage, right? Whether it's good or bad, it's sometimes also very pleasant to break something or to smash things, as they sometimes say. And then he goes on in the same chapter to talk about, he says, the crystal palace, um, it is even unthinkable. Suffering is doubt. It is negation. And what good is a crystal palace in, what, in which one can have doubts? And yet I'm certain that man will never renounce real suffering. That is destruction and chaos. Suffering, why this is the sole cause of consciousness. Um, he says, consciousness, for example, is infinitely higher than two times two. The only possible thing to do then would be to stop up our five senses and immerse ourselves in contemplation. Uh, it may be retrograde, but still it's better than nothing. And then he goes on to talk about the, if the crystal palace is a chicken coop and it starts to rain. Um, yeah. So. Wow. Well, oh, at the end of that chapter, at the end of chapter 10, I said, I wrote down, LOL. He's a streamer. He says, um, he says, on the contrary, I would let my tongue be cut off altogether. I'm convinced that our sort, the underground ones, ought to be kept on a tether. That we're capable of sitting silently under, uh, in the underground for 40 years. Once we do come out and let loose, we talk, talk, talk. He's a, like you said, he's the basement dwelling uh, autist streamer. Um, just yeah, yeah, he's the, the he's the the guy who, <laughs> you know, that he's, he's he's doing self. <clears throat> he's doing yeah. what would you call it? He's doing a. Uh, he, he's 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 ranting at the haters on YouTube who he's right. imagining, right? So it's, and he does this a lot. The narrator will often insult the audience in some way, or or talk about how well you're probably thinking this, and you would be thinking this, but guess what? I already know that you're thinking this, and he's 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 imagining it. So he's he's always addressing the haters, you know, just like uh, you know the, the <laughs> yeah. you you see the the quintessential you know lonesome. YouTube ranter who's you yeah. know doing uh, therapy uh, into the mirror on YouTube and imagining his audience as haters that he's putting in their place, but never will talk to these people in real life, right? That he won't he won't he won't talk about these ideas with his friends in real life. He won't actually engage with them in real life, but he'll 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 talk about the uh, he'll talk to the mirror about it and. And, and spar it in the mirror to the haters. Well, he's transcended his real life friends, bro. You know, he's transcended. He's hyper They're, they're sheep. They're nothing but sheep. And the, the underground man, he calls them, he calls people sheep at, at certain times in yes. the novel too. They're sheep, bro. So you know, you know, I found the passage. One of the one of the funniest passages is uh, just going back to this idea of like he he he's he's isolated. He's he. he he enjoys self degradation, but at the same time, that self degradation comes from this place of like of pride, right? It's very interesting. It comes from he's vain, he's vain. He admits how vain he is. He's he's self aware enough to see how vain he is and how proud he is. Um, and he, of course, he'll project that on everyone else. Well, everyone else thinks they're better than me. While he's constantly saying that he's better than everyone else, right? It's it's hilarious. So he in the in the passage where he devises this grand scheme, this grand plan to show that he's on equal footing with the world around him, that he's on equal footing with the the man of action, uh, in this army officer who refused to acknowledge him and fight him and duel him in his imaginary. Uh, if, if you if refuse to live up to his imagination in the scene at the billiards uh, spot, he follows him, he stalks him, he buys a coat, which he has to borrow money for, which he resents the man who he had to borrow money uh, in order to get the coat, which is all hilarious. So he talks about, um, yeah, he even mentions, uh, he mentions God in this passage, which I think is really interesting. So he says, um, I even prayed as I approached him that God would grant me determination. One time I had made up my mind thoroughly, but it ended in my stumbling and falling at his feet because at the very last instant, when I was only some six inches away from him, my courage failed me. He very calmly stepped over me, and while I flew to one side like a ball, that night I was ill again, feverish and delirious, and suddenly it ended most happily. That night, before I made up my mind not to carry out my fatal plan and to abandon it all, and with the goal in mind that I went to Nevsky for the last time, that was the place on the river where he would always see this officer. So he's creeping on this guy, and he goes yeah. to the Nevsky River, and he's, uh, he says, uh, just to see how I would abandon it all, suddenly, three paces from my enemy, I unexpectedly made up my mind. I closed my eyes. 
We ran and we ran full tilt, shoulder to shoulder, into each other. I did not budge an inch and passed him on an equal footing <laughs> and did not even look round and pretend or he did not even look round and pretended to not notice it but he was only pretending I am convinced of that I am convinced of that to this day of course I got the worst of it he was stronger but that was not the point the point was that I had attained my goal I had kept up my dignity I had not yielded a step and had put myself publicly on an equal social footing with him I returned turned home feeling that I was perfectly avenged for everything. I was delighted. I was triumphant and saying Italian arias. Of course, I will not describe to you what happened to me three days later. If you've read my first chapter, Underground, you can guess for yourself. So, so he, yeah, this is his great moment of triumph is he bumps into a guy on the street and the dude still didn't even notice him, but he's sure he actually did notice him. He must have been pretending, right? And also, he was stronger than me. I was weaker, but that's not the point. The point is I, I didn't fall and cry crumble at his feet. I love how he pathetically just falls down and crumbles it now on the on the floor before the man before. Um, so yeah, his, his coping and seething leads lead him to leave a to leave a uh, a mean troll comment on his on this guy's right. life that the guy didn't even read. <laughs> so it's you know he's he's got that that the, the spite the the, the seething uh, you know the the like. Um, archetype of what we see now is like people use the word incel, which is, you know, it's, a, it's an overused term. It is an overused term. But this man does really predict uh, the, the incel culture very much. And this idea of he's obsessed with violence, right? But he's too much of a pussy to actually do anything, right? right and he wants right, duels. Right. That's another one of the symbols. He wants to have a duel to put himself on equal footing. And the duel... Yeah, then he it, writes it, a letter. Yeah, 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 a strongly worded letter that, of course, he never he never <laughs> sent to him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find some more passages here. That, um, oh yeah, the uh, one of the cl I think really the I guess the climax of the book. Um, he's talking about envious of all worms on earth. Um, I'm going to hate you for being here and listening. He's talking to Liza. So what, yeah, like you mentioned before, what happens is um, he goes to this, you know, bordello and um, all of the drinking, you know, all the bros are in there drinking and uh, you know, he can't, you know, they're, they, but by the time he gets there, like they've all retired and they're in their rooms with their various, you know, ladies of the evening or whatever. And then he gets this girl, Liza. Um, and then he, he take, I guess, what does he do? He takes her back to his place. Um, well, he, 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 he goes her. to Liza. I mean, they have, there's like two instances, right? There's the, inst the right. there's the interaction with Liza at the whorehouse where he, right. you know, after he comes to, after he had, you know, uh, he'd done his, done his business or whatever. Yes. And he yes. feels, he feels disgusted. And he actually, I, I, there was a really good, um, uh, passage there about how he felt and how he saw the degradation of you know the inversion of love in what he was doing he you know which passage i'm talking about i'm gonna try to find yes that i one. do um he says is this is the one where he says i'm trash uh no that's afterwards um so yeah so the first time he he says all the stuff to her and then and then, and her reaction is pretty amazing because he says, let's see, um, her well, he, reaction to him. He insults her, right? Like he goes yeah, there, yeah. sleeps with yeah. her or doesn't sleep with her. You know, he, he does his duty, degrades her and then, and then has spite for her and starts insulting her and telling her no one will care when you die. I just saw right. this, you know, there was, they carried a coffin out with some whore and she was dead yeah. and no one cared about her and everyone mocked her. And look what's gonna happen to you. You're gonna get, you're gonna die of tuberculosis or some disease, you're gonna die and no one's gonna care and they're gonna bury you in the swamp of St. Petersburg. And uh, it was just very, very cruel. And she yeah, ends and up her, weeping, right? She's like breaks yeah, down. Does. And then her reaction um, after all that, I think it's this time, is her reaction to all that is that she loves him, right? Um, and she says, basically, she she won't leave him. And he describes her as like, oh, this is like, he says, he has this passage about love um, where he talks about like, this is the, this is the invisible thing that, uh, this is God's invisible thing that people can't sort of comprehend. Um, and then, and then after that, um, 
he break yeah then he breaks down um he goes into a frenzy and then okay so the part i'm thinking of is like this is in chapter well, while you look for that, let me. I, I got. I found the quote where he first meets ahead, her. Right. right. So Sverkov and his guys, his boys, uh, that he's known since childhood. He spends the whole evening insulting them. tries to tries to fight one of them. Challenges him to a duel, and they just laugh at him. They're just like, "Dude, you're drunk. Right. Like you're acting ridiculous." <laughs> and then he's. And then they they're gonna leave. Right. He spends three hours pacing around, and it's the, it's a hilarious the way it's described. I mean, it's 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 like nails on a chalkboard reading about the man's actions but it's also he's so contradictory and so absurd that it's like there are some very funny passages from Dostoevsky here in again we're reading the uh, uh, notes from the underground and if you you know if you guys are watching get yourselves a copy of that book and also what, what's up with the, what's up with them super chats y'all we got the stream labs up here we got them we got the bigots watching right now if you guys got any questions or comments make make sure to use the stream labs link if you're watching on YouTube and if you're watching on Rockfin what's up with the Rockfin crew we used to have some. We used to have all the big tippers up on Rockfin. I don't. I think y'all, y'all, y'all been lazy over there. Y'all, y'all up in your underground man caves over there. Y'all best be throwing us some of these, some of these tips on Rockfin. Holler at your boy with a tip. We got a tip here for, from Cookies. Cookies setting a good example. We need some other people to set good examples and drop some tips here. If you like the content, share the videos, like the videos, do all that stuff, but also support us. Support us with them tips. And we got Cookies dropping a $5 tip. Thank you very much, Cookies. Cookies didn't even say anything. Also, you can support yourself and support your own health. Right? You can get the, those, uh, get your hormones balanced so you, don't, so you won't be uh, moaning and kicking and screaming like uh, like the underground man over here, you'll desoy yourself, right? Rather yeah, so you than destroy yourself by hitting up. <laughs> you guys need that shock. Y'all need that shock.com. Right. Guys, hit up shock.com, chok.com. Use that code BIG50, and you're going to get 50% off store wide on everything on their site, right? You want, you want superhuman uh, literary analysis skills? Well, Chalk will give you 50% more of that if you use that coupon code BIG50. Like our boy here, Based Lit Analyzer. Based Lit Analyzer. Getting chalked up before the stream here. Use that code BIG50. You're going to get 50% off the highest quality adaptogens. They got the Purified Shilajit, uh, the Chalk Daily, the Tongcat 100. I use all those every day to help keep your mind and your body and your hormones sharp and on point. Chalk.com. C-H-O-Q.com. 50% off if you use that code BIG50. Also, we got Jethro. There we go. We got we got finally somebody stepping up with a with a tip over on Streamlabs. Y'all, you, you, if you guys like the content, make sure to support it. Like our buddy Jethro here, donating 10 bucks. Says, Epic Stream, gentlemen. Thanks for having BLA on, Tristan. Bayes Lit Analyzer was freestyling some bone thugs the other day. Whoa. He says, I think I'll, we'll need a rap battle between Lil AIDS, <laughs> Young Boomer, and BLA. He wants he wants a rap collaboration. He wants an EP with uh with with Lil Raspy over here. We got Lil Lil Raspy, uh Bayes Lit <laughs> Analyzer. Um <laughs> they they call him cigar cigar throat. That's I like, like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I like that. They call me Lil Raspy. Right? <laughs> Lil Raspy. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Thank you guys for supporting. Uh, share the videos, like the videos, and then drop drop the tips via Streamlabs or up in the chat on Rockfin. <laughs> you guys make sure make sure to support these videos. If you like them, we are one hundred percent user supported. And you guys are our biggest sponsors, as well as our buddies over there at Chalk. So if you use that coupon code at chalk.com, you can support your own health and support the streams here. So um, yeah, you we're talking about we're talking about the underground man here, the uh, notes from the underground, the classic Dostoevsky novel that predicted so much of what we see going on today: AI, transhumanism, incel culture, internet troll culture. Um, yeah. and, and critiqued nihilism in such a brilliant way. Fedor Dostoevsky's famous novel, Notes from the Underground. What you got so there? I found, a, I found a couple passages here that um, I think are pretty uh, revelatory in, this, in terms of the narrative and in terms of um, the underground man's overall sort of expression. And uh, there's a few movies that tie into this as well that I thought of. Um, so, so the scene, yeah, you were just mentioning the scene where, you know, he meets Liza and then he talks about the coffin 
no one will remember you. Oh, you um, know, if you don't mind, I, I, let me just read this, this yeah, quick ahead. quote here. Um, uh, he says, now I suddenly vividly realized how absurd, revolting as a spider was the idea of vice, which without love grossly and shamelessly begins directly with that in which true love finds its consummation. So he's, you know, this is after, you know, consummating their relationship with Liza, the prostitute. He, he sees the the vice in it and how vice without love grossly and shamelessly begins directly with that in which true love finds its consummation the degrading inversion of love that he just in, uh, engaged in yeah um he um that scene with her reminds me of um if anybody's ever seen that bernardo bertolucci movie last tango in paris that marlon brando movie Pro i don't know if anybody else has seen it except me but um it's about a, it, it's pretty similar. I realized while I was reading this, there are a lot of similarities between this and that again, because we have a nameless um, speaker. He actually, he calls himself Paul um, in the, in the film, but he's nameless. That's not his real name. And uh, there's a scene here where he says, besides I, how do you know, maybe I'm just as, as unfortunate as you are. And so I get into the muck on purpose for misery. People do drink from grief. Well, so I'm here from grief. Now tell me, where's the good in it? Here you and I came together tonight and we didn't say a word to each other all the while. And only afterwards you started peering at me like a wild thing and I at you. Is that any way to love? Is that any way for two human beings to come together? It's an outrage. That's what. And he says, it was the game that fascinated me most of all. So here we have this like, again, we have this, this speaker who... He has so many voices, like there are so many different kinds of like personality that come out, even one in, in, in little one brief little passage. So it's like he's 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 criticizing her. Right. And he's and he's saying, like, what you do is murky, dark, twisted, disgusting. But he himself is there at the same time. But then he's like commenting on it and saying it's all a game. Right. It's like a game. It's like a it's a weird well, you see, he sees this domination of her. Like he's he's talking right. about, you know, he can't he can't separate love from tyrannical domination, which is like yeah. a, there's another quote from him where he, where he explains that here here it translates it as a sport. It says the sport in it attracted uh -huh. me most, right? But he's he's pursuing her and he's pursuing her soul in a certain way, right? Now he tells yes. her he's gaslighting her and he's telling her, oh, you you sold your soul, you. Uh, you sell your body, you sell your soul, and you're useless, and no one's going to care about you, and you die just like that whore that just died. Like, is this what really what you want? So he's, he breaks her down, and then he sees, he, he ends up, he like looks at her and sees that she is, you know, she, she's being broken by this. And then he, he, and then he like starts to hate her even more at that moment. Yes. Just, there are these moments when she shows real love and emotion and, and vulnerability. Yeah. It makes him actually despise her, which just shows the the demonic aspect of you know this 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 twisted vision of life and love that this man um, has because he really is, he's self destructive but then destructive of others. And he said he he he, he mocks the whore because she, he says, "Well, you probably owe your madam money." Whereas he borrowed money from his friend that he hates right. so that he could go there. And yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a very hypocritical critique that he makes. He's got a be the beautiful, pa I mean, first he says, do you know that one can deliberately torment a person out of love? But then he goes into this, like, this uh, polemic about, about the beauty of love, um, which is interesting. He says, love is God's mystery and should be hidden from all other eyes, whatever happens. He says, can it be sustained? It rarely happens that it can't be. That's interesting, right? Um, he says, uh, well, and if the husband proves to be a kind and honest man, um, how can love pass? The first married love will pass, true, but then an even better love will come. Then their souls will grow close. They'll decide on all their doings together. They'll have no secrets from each other. Now even work brings joy. Now even if you must occasionally deny yourself bread for, the children's, for your children's sake, there's still joy, he says. Do you, he says, um, it's a heavenly happiness. Do you know, do you love children, Liza? I love them terribly. Um, he says, the father comes up, he'll tear himself away from the breast, bend back, look at the father laughing, as if it really were God knows how funny. And then again and again, he says, um, he says, 
I mean, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful passage. No, he actually, he work. does. He, the, you, you get this glimpse of him here, and this is right after he insults her. So first he insults yeah. her, and then he yeah. starts to, you know, he, 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 he sees that there's this vulnerability in her, and then yes. he launches into this kind of poetic, romantic diatribe about how yeah. we need love and how family is good and like don't you want to ch don't you want children isn't it beautiful right. to have a little baby look how beautiful they are and he i mean it's actually it's one of the longer monologues that he has it's probably the longest monologue he has in the whole book where he's talking to somebody else not just internal monologue but he's talking to somebody else and um and at this point he just insulted her and he just you know tried to demean her but then he sees he sees some vulnerability there, and he and he goes into, um, you know, it says, uh, "Sure thing, Liza happens, in those accursed families in which there is neither love nor God." I retorted warmly, "And where there is no love, there is no sense either. There are such families, it's true, but I'm not speaking of them. You must have seen wickedness in your own family if you talk like that. You must have been genuinely unlucky. Hmm, uh, that sort of thing mostly comes about through poverty. So he 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 starts." So kind of like analyzing her past and he asks her about her father and where she comes from and he he starts to get her to open up and then as soon as she starts to open up he launches into this big beautiful monologue where he's you know talking about you know, love is a holy mystery and ought to and ought to be hidden from the from all other eyes no matter what happens that makes it holier and better i guess in your in your version they use godly and this one they, they used they used holy i could both both work really well um, so then he, he, he gets to the end of this monologue then, and he he starts talking about um, family and, and husband and basically kind of in, insinuating to her that like, hey, maybe I can, maybe we could get married, right? This is the undercurrent of like, maybe we'll get married and I can pull you out of this world of whoring yourself and selling your soul and your body and we could really have a family and have real love and it'll be great. And then he gets to this point, this is what's, and, and, and this is reflected in the beginning of the book. Remember, in the first section when he said, you know, as soon as I come in contact with the, the sublime and the beautiful, I want to do something revolting. I want to do something disgusting. Yeah. And the self-degradation happens. So then he, the, 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 the vanity and the pride pop up. And, it's, and this part is fascinating. So he, he seems very genuine here, but it also, there's a little bit of a corniness and of a literary kind of like, you know, you just maybe, are you repeating things you read in a book, right? Because he- Yes, yes. Yeah, then, she says that. She says that and he says like that that's the last revolt of like, what does he say? He says something like that's the last revolt of somebody who knows that you're telling them the truth and that like- um, Yeah, sarcasm, it, right. Yeah, yeah. That he she's, interprets that that's like, her re it's reaction. It's her like that. final moment of breakthrough, right? She's about to break through. And so but um, check it out at the end of the monologue there like this part's crazy I really I really like this passage he's he gets to the end of this big beautiful monologue yes we must we must we must first learn to live oneself before one blames others it's by pictures pictures like that one must get at you I thought to myself though I did not speak with real feeling and all at once I flushed crimson what if she were suddenly to burst out laughing what would I do then that idea drove me to fury Toward the end of my speech, I really was excited, and now my vanity was somehow wounded. The silence continued. I almost wanted to nudge her. So he, he, he says all this stuff where it seems genuine. It's talking about love. He's talking about connection. And then he's like, well, what if she mocks me? And then in his fantasy, he gets whispered this, right? Like in his mind, what if I'm mocked by her? And then he hates her. And then he flushes, and it's like this: the, the face changing, and the physiology changing, the um, and, and becoming kind of demonic. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, real um, Ted Bundy character um, change here, <laughs> right? Complete um, physiognomy change um, because of mocking, right? And I think that there's so much in that scene that, like, you want it to be. I think there's a scene in The Idiot where it's like, where it's like. Um, and it's, it's, this is almost it where it's like, she's, she's a whore. Right. And he, and you want it to be this sweet scene where it's like, it's almost like this scene where you have, I'm trying to say this right without, you know, it, it's like you're, you're with Mary Magdalene and you're like talking to her and not like, there's no judgment. There's no, there's no, like you want to uplift her out of this 
this deck, this place where she is, uplift her. Like, right, like her. there, there is this feeling. Like he feels it, and that's why yeah. he goes on the most genuine long monologue. But it, it, it's, it's, and it, and it seems real. And he's, he's caught up in the feeling of it. But yeah. then suddenly, whoa! What if she mocks me? And if she doesn't mock him. He just thinks, what if she were to burst out laughing? Right. Oh, they're right. all gonna laugh at you. Yeah. They're all gonna laugh at you. This is. This reminds me a lot of. Um, there are two Shakespearean scenes that this reminds me of. One is Hamlet with, um, with Ophelia, which is like, they're in, they're, you know, it's like Hamlet and Ophelia are supposedly in love. And yet when he comes across her in, in the play, all he does is mock her, right. And tell her to, you know, get thee to a nunnery, like you paint your face, um, you know, and she ends up committing suicide. And the other, the other scene in this, or the other Shakespearean scene that this reminds me of is, the underground man is like really like a um, an Iago character from Othello. Iago is like the arch villain. Uh, if you're an actor, all actors want to play Hamlet or Iago. But Iago like is different from the underground man because like he's incapable of shame. He has no sense of shame. But he does the same thing in the play. You know, he he poisons. He he's he's probably the same in the sense that like he's afraid of being mocked and he turns villain just to preclude a situ, you know, to prevent a situation where he has to be the butt of butt of a joke. So he can be like this arch villain and he ends up poisoning the ear of everyone in the play so that they can all die. Right. Um, he, he convinces Othello to that his wife Desdemona has cheated on him. So then he gets Othello to smother her with the pillow. Like, and there's no, there's no like explanation or reason. It's just pure, pure evil and villainy, but it reminds me a lot of this. Um, there's also the image that recurs, um, like on page 105, she bit the pillow and she bit her hand until it bled. And the, yeah. the, 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 um, there's, that is also on page in my book on page 36. Um, so long as I live and desire my, let my hand wither. If I bring even one little brick for such a tenement house. So the, the, I, the, one of the images, one of the symbols in this is the withering hand or like the, you know, if my if my hand should offend me, right? Um, and it occurs. Remember, he buys the gloves earlier so that he can run yes. into the. And he yes. he has to decide whether he wants the black gloves or the yellow gloves, and he can't get the yellow right. gloves because those don't fit the aesthetic that he's looking for. It's such fancy. a oh, such yeah, he's a such a he's such, such a fag, right? Like he's so he's so yeah. vain, and he can't. He has the like I just he's he's so. He hates everyone else for being materialistic, and the but at the same time, he's the most materialistic. <laughs> right. Um, another film that I got that at the climax of the of the novel. I don't know if I've been calling it a play this whole time. I'm sorry. It's a novel. It's a novel, you guys. Don't get on me. Um, uh, he says is the scene where he breaks down and weeps. He sobs. Um, she was so downtrodden, poor thing. She considered herself infinitely beneath me. How could she be angry or offended? And then he says, they won't let me in. I can't be good is how this is translated. I barely brought out, then went to the sofa, fell face down and sobbed for an hour in real hysterics. She leaned towards me, embraced me and remained as if frozen in that embrace. And this is like, this is stolen completely um, in um, Rebel Without a Cause. You remember that scene in Rebel Without a Cause? I've, I've never parents. seen the film. No, I've never seen oh, that. Man, oh man, it, he's, that, this is him. But he's a teenager and he and he gets home and the parents, the parents are, you know, they're all, you know, nobody understands me. And he's just had this like he wanted to do a, a, a he was playing chicken with the other guys in the cars and he gets home and he's got this red jacket on. and He says, they're tearing me apart. They're tearing me apart. Like nobody understands me. Right. And then he runs away. And that's the way that he breaks down is like it's, it's completely it's taken uh, from this pretty verbatim. Um, he says, without power and tyranny over someone, I really cannot live, but, but reasoning explains nothing. And consequently, there's no point in reasoning. And then the feeling of domination and possession. Um, it's crazy, crazy. Um, let's see. The, well, yeah, I mean, it could be, it's amazing, like, the, you know, he, how he switches so quickly, right? So in the, in the scene with Liza, he goes from 
you know, uh, first of all, you know, they, 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 they copulate, he pays her for sex, then he feels disgusted by it, then he starts telling her, oh, you're, you're disgusting, you're just probably going to die, and you should get your life together, and then he gets this idea, well, oh, I can, I can save you, I can save, you know, it's like, the, and I guess this was a, a popular trope at the time in, like, romantic novels of, like, the redeemed prostitute, and he kind of flips yeah. it on its head, though, because the character doesn't redeem the prostitute, in fact, he yeah. has no way to redeem the prostitute because he is just like her right and in fact but but she is she is shows him the most true love out of anybody in the book and he completely rejects it right so he 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 comes to her he he starts to like you know starts speaking about love and goes on this long monologue and it's all beautiful and flowery and then he gets pissed off because he imagines that she might be able to mock him for it because he feels vulnerable right he he starts to expose a true vulnerability as soon as he feels that he despises the person that sees him and that he's there with the person that he's about to commune with he 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 neglects them right so it's you know the neglection of real love the neglect the neglecting of god the neglecting of christ is ultimately what this character represents is the the the, the hyper rationalistic uh, um, world that that will reject real love and then there's there's something there in the symbolism of the, the the prostitute as well Liza is she is kind of like his reason right she she no. very much is like yeah. love and reason to him she's kind of like this I mean she 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 has the ability to she is a possible uh, arc of um, she she opens up a doorway to a possible character arc where he could ultimately save her, save himself, be saved by her. But he hates that. He hates her for that, right? And yeah. and she 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 is she's the prostitute, right? She whores out her soul. She whores out her body. But she actually offers him a true glimpse uh, at love, which there's yeah, something so that's so. Consider how she's redeemed and and is everything that he wants to be, like in his own viewpoint. Right. In, in what he values, she she is everything that he wants to be in the sense that she she is like degraded. He's degraded. Um, she lives like in this murk and filth. He lives in murk and filth. Um, he desires human contact. She gets she attains human contact. Right. Um, he desires. He wants love and she has love. She gives him love. And then at the end, like. He wants to be, he's more based than everybody or whatever. And he wants to be underground. He want, He's the underground man. Nobody else is on his level. And what happens um, at the end, she, it says, um, she, let's see, I was shameless enough to tap softly on the screen. Reminder. It says, how does she exit? She goes downstairs, right? He's upstairs. She goes downstairs into the underground and exits out the door beneath him, yeah. right? She's more underground than he ever will be. And then he pays, he even like, he gave her the money, right? He left like the five rubles or whatever. She denies it. She leaves it there. So she's like giving up her, the thing that made her, you know, base and low and then walks out the door on him. And then it says he, um, he, it was, he, he trails her outside and the snow was falling heavily still. Cause the snow is like the whole, the whole section is called uh, apropos of wet snow. Right. So he's out in the cold. He's out in the cold and he's like smothered and dampened by this, like this heavy insulation, even though it's like this, you know, it's purity and it's whiteness that she exits into, but he's like oppressed by it. And then it says the street lamps flickered uh, glum, uh, glumly and uselessly. She walks into light. I ran about 200 steps to the intersection and stopped. He, he trails her to the crossroads, right? And she's gone and that's it. And he's, he weeps in repentance but it's too late for him. So she's everything that he, she, it's so ironic, right? She's everything that he wanted to be and he couldn't get low or high enough to like attain it. And he had everything that he had right in front of him. And, he and all he could do it. is spit on it and insult it and mock right. it and hate it, right? She, she's sure. a reflection of him, but a reflection of him offering and accepting real love and redemption and not just yeah. falling into... Uh, you know, intense pride, vanity, and despair, um, and it's and it's amazing because like the progression of it, it's, it's so funny. It, it flips on its head. This like, you know, the uh, you know the wealthy aristocrat redeems the 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 the, the debased whore, uh, and yes. instead of the whore being redeemed, he gets her to the point where she breaks down and weeps when he's at the whorehouse, and then 
at that point, he's just like, oh shit, what have I done? I've, I've dominated her. I've gotten what I want and who cares? It's like, I'm just gonna go home now back and live alone and, and, and think about how cool I am and how shitty she right. is. And he felt, he felt, uh, what do you say? I feel wretched, right? Um, uh, he, he gives her his address and then just leaves. And then after this, he, the next day, he just, he, uh, he kind of feels really good about his situation with his buddies and he writes some letters, a real pretentious letter to his friend, like apologizing. Oh, I'm sorry. I was a little bit drunk, but you know how it goes, you know, as if the guys are going to even read. And then, and then he starts stewing and he he becomes terrified that Liza might show up at his house because he invited her to his house, gave her his address. So he's like, why did I give her my address? And then he starts projecting all this hatred on his servant, Apollon, which is like a hilarious passages. He's like, I'm going to withhold money from him. I'm not going to pay him what I owe him because screw him. He just tortures me. And how does he torture him? Well, by just looking at him. Every time he right. looks at him, the underground man thinks he, he I don't now he's an unworthy, he's an untrustworthy narrator. And his, his servant will look at him and he'll say, oh, he looked at me for two minutes or he looked at me for a minute and a half. And it's like, well, is this real? We don't really know, right? But we know that he feels this passage of time is protracted when there's eyes upon him, when he feels vulnerable. And he yeah, says the passage that- of time, The passage of time and the looking at it is because, I mean, I think he's doing here, as, I guess it's kind of like a basic, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of innovative, I guess, but. So he, so Apollon or um, Apollo, right, is the passage of time is him, you know, Apollo is, is transversing the sky, right? And Apollo is the face of the sun. He's looking at him in full light. He sees him for who he is. And the underground man is like a Dionysian figure. He just went to this, he, he just came out of drunkenness, right? So he experienced like the, the, the happiness of the drunken, you know, the drunken night, but also the the you know the the remorse and the 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 vile you know degradation of the morning after, and so we have this like sort of dialectic between the two figures. I don't know if that makes any sense. He also uh, he also fornicates right, which is the Bacchic, you know the Dionysian Bacchic right. So I thought that was an interesting element that he threw in. You know, I look at uh, the Apollon character is really fascinating, right? So he, he, he like you said, he fornicates, he goes, he gets drunk, degrades uh-huh. himself for before his friends, mocks his friends, tries to basically tries to get some guy to duel him. Right? He yeah. could have gotten killed. Yeah. Yeah. He like almost you know almost commits suicide fight by me, officer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Fight me, bro. Let's yeah. fight to the death. IRL yeah. fight, bro. Fight me, IRL. <laughs> <laughs> so so he he does all this degrading stuff. He comes home feeling like crap. He's gonna be hung over. Um, and then like after a day passes, he starts ruminating on, on Liza. He says, one day passed, however, a second and a third. She did not come and I began to grow calmer. I felt particularly bold and cheerful after nine o'clock. Cause that's when he knew she started working. Right. So he's like, he's dreading having to actually deal with the repercussions of what he just set up this possible real human connection with Liza. And he says, um, I, I even began sometimes to dream and rather sweetly. I, for instance, became the salvation of Liza. Simply through her coming to me and my talking to her, I develop her, educate her. <laughs> Finally, I notice that she loves me, loves me passionately, and I pretend not to understand. I don't know. However, why I pretend? Just for effect, perhaps. At last, all confusion, beautiful trembling and sobbing, she flings herself at my feet and tells me that I am her savior and that she loves me better than anything in the world. I am amazed, but Liza, I say, can you really believe that I have noticed your love? I saw it all. I divined it, but I did not dare to approach you at first because I had an influence over you and was afraid that you would force yourself out of gratitude to respond to my love, would try to rouse in your heart a feeling which was perhaps absent, and I would not wish that because it would be tyranny. I would be, it would be indelicate. In short, I launch off at that point into European inexplicably lofty subtleties a la George Sand, but now, now you are mine. You are my creation. You are pure. You are beautiful. You are my beautiful wife. And we will begin to live happily together. Go abroad, etc., etc. In short, in the end, it seemed vulgar to me myself, and I began to put out my tongue at myself. So he starts to think about, like, possibly, you know, having real love with her, but then he turns it into a domination thing where he owns her and becomes a god to her and a Christ figure to her, right? So he sees himself replacing Christ and becoming God and then he's like yeah whatever screw that you know and then he then he insults her and is like uh, yeah, calls her a hussy her. calls yeah, her a whore 
Yeah. yeah, so he becomes the white knight and then gets disgusted and then and then he starts projecting his hatred onto his servant, <laughs> which is so funny. Like immediately goes to Apollon and he says, uh, he says, he drove me beyond all patience. He was the bane of my life. The curse laid upon me by providence. We had been squabbling <laughs> continually for years and I hated him. My God, how I hated him. I believe I had never hated anyone in my life as I hated him, especially at some moments. He was an elder elderly, dignified man who worked part of his time as a tailor, but for some unknown reason, he despised me beyond all measure and looked down upon me insufferably. So he, again, he's projecting his insecurity on the, on the heavy. He hates me, looks down on me, looks at me, but all the guy does is serve him in the narrative here. Right. Of course, it's always the servant and the fool who is the greater man. And, and then also Apollo and he reads Psalms, right? And this and the underground right. man despises when he actually when he, when he reads Psalms. He says he hires him he hires himself out to read the Psalms over the dead. And at the same time he kills rats and makes shoe polish. But at that time I could not get rid of him. It was as if he were chemically combined with my existence. So the, the man that he's the closest with, he hates the most. What does that show you about him? Yeah. Um, God, he's such a loser. The way and, he's and, and Dostoevsky is such a brilliant like, psychologist, too. Like, he, he really, is. even, he you know, I think Nietzsche said something like, the only psychologist I have anything to learn from is, uh, is Dostoevsky. Right. And he is, I mean, Freud, Freud is, a, is a retard. Right. Well, he and, like, but yeah, he, Dostoevsky really is a brilliant human psychologist because he, he sees into the soul. Especially in this book. Yeah. He contaminates us. You know, he, he, um, he like infects, he infects the reader, right? So it's like you you get into this mode where you understand you understand exactly what these characters are saying and their motivation. You can picture the characters perfectly. And he doesn't tell us, he shows us. You know, he shows us the, the situation. He shows us um, the mentality um, and the motivation of these characters. And like, he really does, he really, I mean, he's, he's his prose is Shakespearean. Like he, he understands, um, he understands like the human experience and, and, and in a way that's like both modern and, you know, timeless. Um, and even the way that he ends, he's so brilliant too as an innovator in terms of his prose. I mean, the way that he ends the book, he says, it's a burden for us even to be men, men with real, uh, our own bodies and blood, which is actually Ram Rambo stole that um, for the end of a season in hell. There's so much that Rambo and Baudelaire and T.S. Eliot stole from this book. Um, Freaking Sylvester own, Stallone, man. Sylvester book. Stallone ripping everyone off, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was the end of Rambo too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, we dedicate this to the brave men and women of the Bajati. Uh, he says, we're ashamed of it. We consider it a disgrace. We keep trying to be some unprecedented omni men. We're still born and have long ceased to be born of living fathers. And we like this more and more. We're acquiring a taste for it. Soon we'll contrive to be born somehow um, from an idea, but soon, uh, but enough. I don't want to write anymore from the underground, he says. And then it says, however, the notes of this uh, paradoxalist do not end here. He could not help himself and went on, but it also seems to us that this may be a good place to stop. It's like total schizo ending. Yeah. At the end, well, I like how Dostoevsky separates him from the character. Like he's, he's like, you know, here, right. this is where the character stops, you know. Yes. He, but, but you can tell that the speaker is the one writing that about himself, right? Because he has no ending. He has no deliverance. He doesn't know where to end this. And in fact, the end of this is the beginning. The, end, the beginning and the end are the same, right? So, <laughs> it's good. yeah, it's a well, and and you know the, the the narrative, the way that the character is developed, right? Like you I mean, he first he, do, he 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 copulates with the whore, then he mocks the whore, uh, then he woos her and uh, and and kind of seduces her, and then she breaks down crying, and he doesn't want to deal with it. He leaves, right? And then he yes. stews over it for several days. She finally shows up at like the, this moment when he's when he's 
the most degraded, right? He's like, he's in his, his crappy apartment, which he thinks is so terrible and, and, and poor, and he thinks it's wretched and gross and muddy and filthy. And, uh, and he's, he's just blasting and abusing and gaslighting Apollon about his pay that he should be paying him, but he's bitter about, he's always bitter about money, right? So he's got this money thing and he, he doesn't want to pay Apollon and he's abusing him about it. Even though Apollon said nothing, he's just in his fantasy world just thinking, oh, he's, he says Apollon out of his pride, right, won't bring up that he wants me to pay him, but I am going to show him how to be humble by torturing him because he's torturing me by, you know, it's just this, it's really twisted, it's schizo and psychotic. And then, and then Liza shows up and she tells him, she shows up and then he, um, he, they, they, he copulates with her again. Um, let's see. It just So he, she shows up, and he's really pissed that she shows up. And then he reconciles real quick with Apollon and pays Apollon so then Apollon can go get him tea so that he can seem That's like right. he's got his stuff together a little bit, right? He goes and gets the tea, and then... Um, and then starts yelling about how he's going to kill Apollon and how he hates him. And the chick's just like, wait, what's going on here? Um, and he gives her the tea. And then he starts feeling the spite, right? So she, she comes and he says, Liza, do you despise me? I asked, looking at her fixedly, trembling with impatience to know what she was thinking. She was embarrassed and did not know what to answer. Drink your tea, I said to her angrily. I was angry with myself, but of course it was she who would have to pay for it. A horrible spite against her suddenly surged in my heart. I believe I could have killed her. To revenge myself on her, I swore inwardly not to say a word to her at all. At all, She is the cause of it all, I thought. So then he's just silence for like, it says five minutes, right? He just sits there silent with her. And she finally breaks the ice and says, I, w I want to get away from there altogether. She began to break the silence in some way, but poor girl, that was just what she ought not to have spoken about at such a moment. Stupid <laughs> enough, even without that, to a man so stupid as I was. My heart positively ached pity for her tactless and unnecessary straightforwardness, but something hideous at once stifled all compassion in me. It even provoked me to greater venom. Let the whole world go to pot. Another five minutes passed. So I, it's, it's hard to tell how, how much time really passed, but he, he's always taking note of time and the clock, and the clock hisses at him, and the clock screams at him, and the clock, you know, the clock's always, it's almost a character in and of itself. But then he, then he just jumps into, into insulting her again. He insults her and tells her, basically, I hate you, you're useless, why are you here, go away, and then, and then she, uh, he starts bawling, right? Is it like he starts yeah. just crying, or does she start crying first? Yeah, he he starts. That the clock is interesting. To bring up um, it does time. Um, sort of this this entire book sort of exists in a timeless kind of dream state. Um, at least that's what I get from part one. I mean, is, is that we time? There is no time. Time is sort of stopped, and yet, especially in part two, whenever the clock strikes, we have this sort of you know, we were talking about Catcher in the Rye earlier. We have this sort of pro programmed, you know, this programmed uh, clock strike that sort of chips the mood um, in a in in like violent ways. Um, and he says, um, "Let's see." At the end, um, oh, I forgot. We forgot to talk about um, the idea of purification in this. Um, what, the thing that he that the speaker here um, specifically takes away from that last scene, especially after she leaves, after she exits, you know, underground and outside. Well, he, he insults her, and then he seduces. Uh, he insults her, and then he weeps, and then he seduces yeah. her, and yeah. then he despises her again and insults her again, and yes. then and she and, and just he ignores her and then feels ashamed, and then she's going right. to leave. He runs up to her, puts money in her hand. Right, who yes. insult her again of like, look, I paid for the sex. Like it wasn't, even though it was, you know, it seemed like a mutual embrace after yeah. he felt genuine, like he broke down and just wept. He, he rage cried in her lap like a soy jack, <laughs> right? He did the soy jack rage cry right in her lap and she comforts him. And then, uh, then he looks up and he, it says, uh, the one feeling intensified the other. It was almost like an act of vengeance. At first, there was a look of amazement, even of terror on her face, but only for one instant. She warmly and rapturously embraced me. So he, like, seduces her again, and then, but, you know, just 
yeah, whatever, you know, here's some money. Right. Yeah. Um, and she leaves it. She leaves the money. Right? She leaves it on the table and leaves. Um, and he doesn't notice that until he, he, he ran, he decides he wants to run out and try to catch her again. He, you know, right. he's constantly back and forth and like changing his mind. And then he realizes that she had thrown the money on the ground in front of the table. Yeah, she, she probably left. The other side of the story is she probably left and was like, oh, my gosh, there's this dangerous schizoid that keeps pursuing me and keeps, you know, I think this guy's psychotic and he's going to end up killing me. He, she may be right. Um, <laughs> or, or, right, take, to, take her to his underground or whatever that is. Um, but, um, no, but, you know, he says... Um, he says, and won't it be better? Yes, better. I fancied later back at home, stifling the living pain in my heart with fantasies. Won't it be better if she now carries an insult away with her forever? An insult. But this is purification. It's the most stinging and painful consciousness. So that's yeah, kind like, of a weird passage. What do you think? What do you think about that one? Yeah, I don't I really know what, what to make saying, of that. I think what he's saying there is that once she leaves maybe he can at least leave her with an insult, right? He wants to get the last word. He wants to degrade her one last time because it's something. Because for him, something is better than nothing. It's like some sort of contact or some sort of domination. Oh, right. Yeah, it goes back to the, the he, he says before that, right? Like a few pages before that, uh, um, I know I know I shall be told that this is incredible, that it is incredible to be as spiteful and stupid as I was. It may be added, it was strange that I would not love her or at any rate appreciate her love. Why is it strange? In the first place, by then I was incapable of love. For I, uh, I repeat, with me, loving meant tyrannizing and showing moral superiority. I have never in my life ever been able to imagine any other sort of love and have nowadays come to the point of sometimes thinking that love really consists in the right freely given by the beloved object to be tyrannized over. And, you know, because he's, he's, he's the hyper-rationalist, right? Like it's the love, like what is love to him? It, it, all there is is the will to power to somebody who's a materialist rationalist. All you have is domination, is, is power and the will. And, um, you know, what, what is love really in his rationalistic worldview? He, he felt glimpses of it, but every time he feels it, he destroys it. He degrades it. He says, no, you're a whore. When it's really, it's his reason that is a whore. It's him. He is the whore, and he whores himself out to the destruction. He whores himself out to the death. He whores himself out to self-degradation because he has turned his reason, his love, his heart into a into, in, into basically a, a a real whore well consider also that you know um just to go back to like the beginning and the title right and when we talked about you know the incel and all that stuff i mean one of the things here is that for him you know he he has some sort of contact with this person he has power over them and then she leaves and then there's nothingness right she leaves him the money that he gave to her. She walks out into the snow. She walks out into, you know, the future and purification. Um, she's gone and he can't, um, he can't have any contact with her. He can't, there's no like contact with her. And, um, and for like the, the think about the person who like any kind of attention is better than is, is good attention, right? Even if it's hateful attention. And so the most powerful thing is silence. Right. The, the, the silence is what kills him. She leaves. And then that's when he that's when he sort of splits here, by the way. Also, he says, and in fact, now asking out a question of my own, which is better, cheap happiness or lofty suffering? Well, which is better? And he says, such were my reveries as I sat at home that evening, barely alive from the pain in my soul. I remain pleased with the phrase about the usefulness of insult and hatred, even though I myself almost became sick then from anguish. And this is where he, his mind splits here because then he said like his narrative splits, his voice splits. He says, even now, after so many years, all this comes out some somehow none too well in my recollection. In other words, he can't reconcile the fact that, that he couldn't get the last word. He couldn't get domination power and she's gone and he's got silence and nothingness. And then 
what does he do? What does he do? He just speaks to himself. That's the what's what the whole book is, is him speaking to himself. He's speaking to himself. He's writing to himself. We, the reader, are supposed to be the listener, right? We, we like picture ourselves on the other side of, you know, the, the, the underground basement that we're hearing this from. But literally, this is just a guy who's he's writing his thought. I mean, he comments on the fact that he's of the, the purposefulness and like the weird meta um, uh, uh, awareness of writing on paper and like reading his own thoughts. That's why, it's, that's why throughout the narrative, he's always self-editing. Right. He'll always say like, oh, I said this. No, I didn't mean to say that. Or don't scratch that out. Right. Because he's talking to himself and there's there's no one to listen to him, even though he's he's speaking out into the darkness. I, I yeah. He's, he's coping into the into the mirror. Right. I mean, right. He's, Absolutely. and, and the, Absolutely. the last the last insult to him is, I mean, it's what, what a blow, because even earlier in the first segment, his stream of consciousness that sets up for everything that happens in the second segment, he, he com- compares himself to a mouse, compares himself to a rat. Right, that's right. Um, and he says he a mouse always feels insulted, right? He that's always right. feels that way that he's been slighted, right? And that's you know of course stems from like a, a pride, a vanity, and like a self worship. I mean he he, right. en- he ends up showing really that he did. He desired to be worshipped by Liza. He wanted to be worshipped by Apollon. He says Apollon, I'm not gonna you, I'm not gonna pay him until he gets down on his knees and begs me. And he tells this to Apollon, and Apollon says no, that's not gonna happen. And yeah. by the way, I could. He's, he goes. By the way, I could call the cops on you for insulting me like that. And he's like, yeah. "Well, go ahead, call the cops on me. I command you to call the cops on me right now." And then this is like, and he's he's re- building up to this crescendo of like a psychotic breakdown with Apollo, and, and that's when Liza shows up. So then there's another right. insult: is the love shows up. He sees love coming to him, and a possible door to redemption coming to him as a great insult, right? <laughs> well, I think we did it. Notes from the underground, you guys. There you Epic go. Book. Epic book. Yeah, I mean, it's like we, we we didn't even scratch the surface on we what didn't. could be what could be said about this novel, right? We yeah. cannot do it justice. This is a it is a masterwork by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Well, would you say 1864? Yeah, I think 1864. Yeah. 1864. So let's uh, we got we actually we got we got a couple bigots dropping some stream labs here, okay. dropping them tips on the stream labs. Beth Ellen Nagel, donating $15, says, great discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. We appreciate the support. You guys, if you're watching now, you can drop a tip via Streamlabs. You can't do it on YouTube. This video is not monetized on YouTube, but you can tip via Streamlabs, and the link is in the description. Macrina Film Trip says, for $5, great stream. I'd love to see more on Dostoevsky. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely reading more Dostoevsky as much as I can get my hands on, as much as I can make time for. And yeah, I may, hopefully I can get our boy Bayes the Lit Analyzer over here. We're going to put his link will be down in the description or, or the uh, the link. I'll pin the link in the, uh, in the comments for his YouTube channel. How about that? And uh, maybe we can convince him to come back on and talk more. Let's see if we got any other tips on Rockfin. Rockfin crew, look at this Rockfin crew. You, you degenerates on Rockfin. What is your deal? We got we got to gaslight you into dropping more tips. Uh, we got a we got a we got a underground man gaslight you into into giving us your tips on that on Rockfin. Thank you guys for sharing the videos, liking the videos. Thank you guys for watching on YouTube for hitting the thumbs up. Uh, share the videos, like the videos. There will be more of this to come. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's there's so much that he, that he, <clears throat> that Dostoevsky, in the book Notes from the Underground, uh, there's so much that he predicts about what is coming uh, in the in the preceding centuries, including the hyper rationalistic AI, the scientism leading to despotism. Um, you know, the, the you will own nothing and you will be happy. Um, the internet troll culture, incel culture. This is just, uh, this book is, is amazing. Is there anything we forgot, Hanley? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's, um, the symbolism in the book is, is heavy and we could do entire streams just on a couple of passages and on the I mean, even on the literary style, on the the point of view um, of the speaker, uh, on the kind of plurality of the speaker's voice. But I think that, like, I think we did a pretty good job of covering um, uh, some of the deeper elements that that 
you know, you, you would take from, from the speaker um, in this and, and, and sort of applying it to now and to the future. I mean, uh, you can read this novel in, um, in so many, like with so many levels in, in mind, you could talk about, you know, the 19th century and, and reason, logic, you talk about capitalism and all that kind of stuff. But I think that what, what we, we what we've tried to do here is um, discuss some of the so some of the the worldview that we can take from from I don't know from Dostoevsky but from um, contrasting the the speaker's worldview here with what we see now and that you've done such a good job of you know for years on this channel talking about you know technocracy tra transhumanism um, all the different globalist um, elements that are see that seep their way into society and a control control structure and I think that you know. It's strange with novels and with prose because um, we're not reading, you know, I, I personally, I tend to read um, history. You know, I, I like reading history. Um, but when you read a book like this, when you read fiction, fiction can give you an insight into something that, you know, that history or that, you know, um, that even, you know, globalist, globalist elite, you know, white papers can't, which is um a feeling behind it that that we as human beings can like apply to our own lives and see and and, and glean some sort of truth from that. Yeah, like um, Father Sarah from Rose uh, often said that he he would recommend that you know people who are trying to you know heal their their noose the eye of their soul he would recommend that they would read literature as well as you know listening yeah. to classical music uh these things do have a benefit for forming the mind for structuring the mind and for understanding human behavior and dostoevsky clearly is a he's a genius as far as seeing into the human soul seeing into the the human psyche and i think yeah. that's v very much because of him coming from that orthodox worldview, having been a repentance nihilist revolutionary, becoming an orthodox Christian, and even a you know a monarchist, he has a fa he's a fascinating character. So I mean, you mentioned studying history. I think studying history and literature simultaneously is something that is right. is real beneficial for understanding where we're at right now, and particularly you know nineteenth century uh, Russian history is. Yeah. This is the precursor to the revolutionary demonic bloodbath yes. that was the 20th century. And Dostoevsky yes. saw it coming. He saw the rivers of blood coming. And this is what the underground man is, who's the character in Notes from the Underground, is, um, is, is in many ways, he's haunted by this. How the, but how relevant is that to now? It's so, it's, it's even more, it feels even more relevant now. You know, that... That yes, I mean that that is true, absolutely. Um, and Do and Dostoevsky lived in that time, and those things were true. But like the way that his prose reaches into the future, and so much of what he says in this book is true now, all over again. And and that's what really struck me with this book is that, you know, when you read history and and well, well when you read history or when you read articles or whatever, you know, yes, those things can be you know they're factual and they give you information, but. But a lot of times when we read art, when we read literature, we get ideas and we hear a voice, you know, we hear a, a, a voice that we can't hear in, 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 in other mediums. And, you know, I think that it's important to keep reading this type of work because it really speaks, you know, it speaks to you. It speaks to your soul. It speaks to you as a person and, and allows you to, to look at situations in the world and to decipher things and, and for yourself. And I think that's what makes him really powerful. I mean, this guy is great. I mean, he is so awesome. I, yeah. I just like, I, I love reading. I love reading this book. Um, and, you know, if you're watching this and you haven't read this book or you haven't read the Brothers Karamazov or or any of um, his other works, like. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm, I've just been getting, I mean, I'm like a little more than halfway through uh, but, Demons, which is, yeah. I mean, I, I really, if you want to understand the history of the Bolshevik Revolution, Dostoevsky's Demons. Look no further than Dostoevsky's yeah. Demons. I mean, this is not just a supplementary book that you could read to understand, you know, what happened with the Bolshevik Revolution, or shoot, what happened with the French Revolution as well, but what ha what's happening now. You want to understand why the things that you're seeing, you why you are seeing these things. Um, uh, Demons is a fantastic book. It's also sometimes translated as The Possessed, but I think, from in my opinion, I think Demons is a better... 
uh, translation of the, the the title there than the possess because it really it's although there are no demons in the book as far as characters go you'll see when you read this book that it actually is about the demonic it is about demons even though there's not a demon that's an actual character the demons are throughout the <laughs> throughout the novel so maybe maybe we can do some of that next i don't know if you got the time it's kind of like another one of those books that's <laughs> it's like you could just endlessly analyze I got and, time. always yeah. got time for books always got time for um literature and for awesome discussion especially with our our homies like you um and i listen i really truly really appreciate you asking me to be on here this was great and um and I think that people probably got a lot out of this. I certainly got out of, a lot out of it. And um, shouts out to you, Tristan, Primal Edge Health. And thank you so much for having me on here. And listen, you guys, if you're watching this, don't forget, please go over to my channel at Bay's Lit Analyzer and hit the subscribe button. Give me some subs. Okay, go back, watch my videos, give me some likes. And um, we're going to keep barreling forward and, and hopefully um, – We'll be back on here again with our homeboy. And, that, um, you know, that was a lot of fun. So thank you, sir. I appreciate you it. That link is in the chat on YouTube. The link to his channel. I'm going to drop it as well up in the comments and in the description. So, yeah, we'll go check out Bay's Lit Analyzer. We're trying to get him to 2 million subs by the end of the yeah, day. Right. We're, we're right. thinking we can do it. A.K.A. <laughs> his, his, rap, his rap name is Lil Raspy. Um <laughs> We will be hopefully yeah get get yourself a, a copy of the demons if you could find this one this well I don't know it's always interesting to have someone with a different translation too mine's the penguin classics but okay. yeah we'll we'll do the, maybe we'll do this one next I have been talking about this novel off and on in some streams so we'll have to we'll have to zoom in and focus on it maybe it'll probably take a series maybe we could break it up into sections and talk about specific themes within it. Uh, and having to do with you know history and the, and the history of revolutionary movements, the history of the shoot the genocides of the 20th century. Right. Um, so yeah, my boy Basil Analyzer here. Thanks for coming on and yes, everybody for you. watching. Thank you very much, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Peace. Thank y'all. Peace.